Uh, thank you, Ms. Ananya, for sharing us a beautiful video of Village Patuas. Um, now let's move on to the first session of the meeting and let us dive deep into the establishing a sustainable relationship between ICH and economic utilization. The invited speakers are leading figures of representation between ICH and the economic field. I'm confident that this time will be valuable for all interested in the discourse of cultural consumption. As a keynote speaker and moderator, Mr. Andrew Sr. is present. Mr. Andrew Sr. is a highly respected international expert in the creative economy and its development with over 20 years of experience in the field. He is a former expert member of the UNESCO EU panel on cultural diversity. Without a further delay, I will hand over the mic to Mr. Andrew Sr. The floor is yours. Mr. Andrew Sr., uh, your microphone is muted. <laughs> Thank there you. Can you hear me? Yes, can I can hear, hear you. Great, okay, fine. My apologies for that, everybody. <clears throat> I'm afraid I'm not the best with technology at times. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here, be here with you today and to be taking part in this in, important colloquium. In a region with such remarkable history, heritage, and culture, characterized by its diversity, not just in cultural terms, but also in its approaches. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the past in India and more recently in Pakistan, uh, working on the creative economy agenda there with colleagues, um, whilst both at the British Council and more recently with UNESCO. And so it's a, uh, it's a part of the world that I hold very dear. Um, I entirely endorse the goal of this discourse to see the network within which approaches to the development of the creative economy can be shared. Whilst I'm convinced there is not one true path and that approaches have to be adapted to place and time, experience tells me that genuine benefit comes from a collaborative approach in which ideas and approaches are shared and further developed. In speaking today, I want to share with you some of my observations and experiences for working on this agenda for almost a quarter of a century. A century. I hope that what follows will be of use. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the focus of uh, my uh, presentation is going to be about economic utilization, whether or not it's the death knell of culture or perhaps its savior. Obviously, the question is polemic. Um, there is a dualism there. There is that yin yang um, notion in terms of looking at them. You, one, you can't really have one without the other. Um, and my aim is to interrogate the role of the creative economy in, also in delivering to the objectives of the 2003 convention. And that's very much about understanding that convention as being a conversation about living culture and living heritage. And in that context, I'd like to start, start by suggesting that in actual fact, um, a market isn't simply a, 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 a market is simply a manifestation of need, interest, and esteem. And therefore, in talking about the market and talking about um, cultural goods and services, creative goods and services, then in actual fact, is there really that much that we need to fear? Um, I entirely accept that there are issues here in terms of traditions and in terms of why, why work is created, what is behind the work. But at the same time, I'm very conscious of the fact that this is something uh, uh, in many ways, which is a survival issue as far as these uh, elements are concerned. And therefore, there is a real need to be able to engage with the market and engage with this notion of the creative economy. Next slide, please. But I better explain, first of all, what really has shaped my, uh, my perspective. Um, I started off my journey 25 years ago in terms of the creative economy. Um, but in actual fact, my professional background is as a lawyer. And I pr practiced commercial law for five years before re realizing that I needed to um, be more engaged with an enduring passion of mine, which was the theatre. So I shifted tack, then a fairly uncommon thing to do, and was fortunate enough to be able to secure work developing and project managing initiatives and latterly producing um, plays um, in one of the UK's leading regional theatre companies up in Yorkshire, which is where I come from. Um, it so was a theatre company which had a remarkable um, 
agenda in terms of social engagement with the local community, which it, which really we wanted to bring into the theatre building, seeing it's it um, other was was this bastion of a space which really most ordinary people didn't want to come along to. You had to be um, somebody who knew something about theatre who to want to really go there. So it was very much about opening it up, and it was part of the company's DNA. From there, I was invited to develop a series of projects for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And that was very much looking at its relationship with its sponsors and how it might diversify what it did to um, provide new revenue streams. And in the course of one of those projects, I ended up uh, working with the British Council. And six months later, I was asked if I was interested in the creative industries and if I would be interested in going to work at the British Council. This was a key part of the Labour Party's new agenda in government. This is back in 1997, 98. And a very new policy initiative being delivered for the first UK Ministry of Culture. And so my journey proper began then. I stayed at the British Council for 11 years, leading a new department and devised new ways of working with the creative sector, particularly with entrepreneurs in the creative sector. That started with a focus on supporting trade promotion initiatives, which range from video games to cultural heritage services, delivered from Shanghai to Sao Paulo. But within two years, shifted away from sales to sharing the policy experience of the creative economy agenda and beginning to consider the role of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship itself in the context of the creative economy, particularly the role, young, role of young people as entrepreneurs. That means that my perspective effectively predates in terms of its, in, its uh, uh, starting point, both the 2003 and the 2005 conventions. In fact, the 2003 convention has never actually been ratified by the UK, it seemed to pass us by, which I suspect is because of the focus on the creative economy within government at that time. However, it's clear that we have a great deal of intangible cultural heritage here in the UK, and um, uh, perhaps it's fair to say that we've taken a slightly different approach, therefore, outside of the, the realms of the 2003 convention in terms of its protection. Um, in terms of the work of the British Council, though, um, we weren't really constrained, therefore, by looking at this from the perspective of either, either 2003 or 2005. It was simply a continuum of culture. So the work that we did there, both in terms of the conversations around policy, but also in terms of the conversations around entrepreneurship, was very much a dialogue which was about the breadth of the creative economy. As I said, from intangible cultural heritage all the way through to the more tech-oriented elements of the creative economy around video games and the like. Um, so that's the perspective through which I've looked at the creative economy, the lens. Um, and what I wanted to really be able to now do with you is to just um, share with you some thoughts that stem from that and the work that I've done over the past 20 years. Um, I think I'll start off by saying, it's fascinating that there is still universally no agreed net definition of what the creative, creative economy is. Um, there's a, a graphic there from the um, Inter-American Development Bank's 2013 document, which rebranded the creative economy as the orange economy. And of course, this is the agenda which has been taken up most recently in Colombia, and actually is at the forefront of that country's development of its um, economic strategy. Um, and it's, it, its development program. Um, we in the UK uh, started off in 1998 with a definition which came from the Department of Culture and Media of Sport, which was based around the exploitation of intellectual property rights. And being a lawyer, that's something which I could readily appreciate very quickly. Um, in actual fact, though, more recently than that, but also in 2013, Neston, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, which is one of the leading think tanks now, in the UK looking at this agenda, um, produced a new manifesto for the creative economy. And that is interesting and I think relevant in, in the context of today's discussion, because it focuses on creative talent in its definition rather than IP. Next slide, please. I say that's important because I think that creative talent is one of the most misunderstood elements in terms of how we talk about the creative economy. From the conversations I've been having recently with conversations in the run-up to this um, conf conference, um, a lot of people have talked about raw materials. But to my mind, the real raw material of the creative economy is in fact creative talent itself. It is the, the raw material. 
Without it, the other raw materials, the, the silks, the cottons, um, the jute, whatever it may be, in actual fact, don't really progress anywhere as far as, them, as, as, far as being creative products themselves. It's the engagement of those creative minds and those creative hands in developing what they're doing that allows those raw materials to reach a new potential and to become something else. So the artifact is actually a direct result of that creative talent. And so I think it's very important for us to start to really understand that the raw material that we're talking about is something which is evenly spread around the world. It's something which in actual fact, wherever there are human beings, there is that creative talent there. And therefore we need to take and to start thinking about this in a different way and think very carefully about how we go about nurturing that talent. Because I believe that's very, very important in terms of what, we, what we're doing. Um, I'll spend a, a moment more on this if I may. I think it's also important to recognize that one of the big changes that's happened over the past decade, partly I think because of the growth in terms of digital technology and social media, is this whole notion of celebrity and the celebrity culture that's emerged. And there's something very odd for me there when I, when I hear people talk about um, the fact that talent isn't recognized and isn't rewarded, because of course it's a situation of in extremes in terms of those people who are re recognized for their creative talent in terms of Hollywood or Bollywood or any of those the kind of major in industries where in actual fact, people are seen as having a very significant profile and that's all about marketing when it comes down to it. That, in actual fact, is what has driven a lot of the uh, revenue attached to that part of the sector. And I think that, therefore, we need to really understand that, um, in actual fact, we need to think about how we go about being better at marketing the work of creative talent in the context of intangible cultural heritage. Next slide, please. Now, of course, when you talk about economics and an economic approach, then you have to talk about the market. And I think that anybody who works in the creative sector today is used to doing about this, doing this. They're used to trying to understand who it is that is going to be buying what they are creating, who it is that's going to be interested in talking about what they're creating. So I think we need to really be conscious of the market and not behave as if it is some unimportant interference, interference which distorts creativity in itself. Yes, it shapes creativity, but it shapes creativity because it ensures that what is being created actually allows the dialogue that you're trying to have to reach your wider audience. It's also fair to say that it's, um, the market is incredibly fickle and is changing rapidly. It can also be manipulated. And of course, one of the principal vehicles for its manipulation is the advertising and the marketing industry, which of course in itself is a facet of the creative industries and the creative economy. So those skills that we are talking about are used there, the creativity is used there to engage people in these dialogues. And we need to think about that and think about what that means, but also we need to think about social media. It's such an important tool today in terms of opinion formers. And driving trends, capturing the zeitgeist. We need to make sure that we're looking at what that is and how in actual fact, we can engage with that conversation and be part of that conversation. And as I've alluded to, technology is really important. Technology changed the nature of the market for creative goods and services in 2007. Social media created a new explosion in terms of opportunity largely because all of a sudden you weren't concerned about just the most local market to you. You actually could deal with something which has been called the long tail, which is about all those people that may consume what you're doing online, may look at the videos about what you're doing in online and may uh, listen to the music or then go and see an exhibition if it comes to their country in that way. All those things are there about helping to build up the market for you, the interest group that is there in terms of the work that you're doing. And I think that is really very important to understand. The market and understanding the market and understanding how to use the tools that allow you to access the market is actually critical as far as the development of the creative economy and the sustainability of the creative economy as well. And then I wanted to just also talk about creative entrepreneurs, which is arguably the area where I've done most work over the past 20 years. 
And I'll say now that I think that creative entrepreneurs are as important as creative talent. And in actual fact, really skilled creative entrepreneurs may be rarer than creative talent. And that's because they have to do something which sets them apart, I think, from ordinary entrepreneurs. Their key skill to my mind is their ability to nurture, guide, and manage mercurial creative talent. And let's face it, the most mercurial raw material that we have is human creativity. You have to nurture it, you have to guide it, you have to um, soothe it when it becomes stressed about what it's doing that is not being recognized and help it to ensure that it is able to develop what it does and move forward. So a creative entrepreneur also seeks, sees and seizes opportunity. And the, one of the key things I think it's important to understand is that there are certain values, I think, within the creative sector, which the creative sector holds very dear. And often those are around equality and fairness and social justice. And um, it's very important, therefore, that a creative entrepreneur is able to be able to align themselves in the way in which they work with those values and that vision of a, a different world within which creativity plays a greater part. And I think the other thing which the, a creative entrepreneur does is also to, to reinvest in talent. There's a recognition of the, the need that there is there to be able to actually take some of the money which comes from the work that they are doing and the profit that they're generating and actually reinvesting that in the development of talent because talent, as I said, is the, the raw material that they have to be able to work with. And I think the other thing which they critically need to do, and I think this is incredibly important and very easily overlooked, is that they are able to be a critical part in the development of the infrastructure of the sector. I did some work for UNESCO a few years ago in Argentina. It was very interesting when I was there. I was asked to go and do a piece of work looking at the television industry and, and television productions for children. And the first thing I said when I got there, and of course it was a piece of work which was being commissioned by the city government, not by the industry. And the first thing I said was, you're asking the wrong question. You're, you're not looking at what is happening as far as the industry is concerned and the market. And the market is changing very, very quickly because people now, including young children, have increasing access to online tools, to um, iPads and to mobile phones. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. We've moved, especially during the course of the pandemic, not just to viewing content on our television screens or listening to it on the radio or, um, uh, or on, uh, 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 on uh, headphones, but in actual fact, we're sitting on a bus or sitting in a car listening or, um, or watching or reading through a device rather than necessarily through a book or a television screen. So I think, you know, really understanding that, that the, the infrastructure is changing and therefore there is a need to also look at the infrastructure of the sector as well. I was fascinated in Argentina that in actual fact, there was nothing there in terms of it, between a writer and a publisher. There were no agents. So it was impossible for a writer to be guided by the agent in terms of what they were doing. And it was impossible for the writer really to negotiate the best deal for themselves in terms of how they presented their work and where they took their work, but also critically, how they took the characters they produced and took them into a different environment. And of course, that is why intellectual property rights in that context become so important because it's that use of copyright and the extra extraction of that value, which is where a lot of value is created. Now, that's not so important in terms of intangible cultural heritage at this stage, but I do think it's important to understand that infrastructure within the industry is actually very important as well. And next slide, please. Um, in the work that we did at the British Council, as I mentioned before, we worked across the whole range of intangible and tangible heritage. And we worked particularly with creative entrepreneurs, trying to provide them with um, critical guidance and getting critical guidance back from them in terms of the way in which we structure the programs we were running. Um, the thing which we found that they wanted more than anything else was help to refine their skills and help to develop new complementary skills. And that wasn't just in the context of 
the creative sector around them, but particularly in the context of their understanding of business. It wasn't for, for a lot of them something which they were used to working in. And it was very clear that the best of them um, uh, on the most effective shared their skills with one another, but also they played a role in building and sharing those skills within communities. They realized that there was far too much within one community for them necessarily to be able to manage themselves to in terms of being the entrepreneur taking them to market. And what they were trying to do was to build up opportunities within those communities for people themselves to become entrepreneurs as well. And that of course is really important because there is always a danger that somebody that at the, at the bottom of the system gets squeezed if you don't have a virtuous notion of what being an entrepreneur actually means. And that, that, that is something which we very much tried to, as I said before, to build in the context of the work that we were doing. Next slide, please. Um, and so I, I just wanted to kind of come towards um, uh, 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 the, the question of this market-led approach. Um, and let really just talk about this very briefly, because I think the critical things here are that there is a need to understand that the production has to have a purpose. There is a need to understand that there is an end consumer who will value the product and that the consumer themselves is understood. And I know that people are very concerned about the value, the intrinsic value that's there, and it's meaning as far as makers are concerned. But if there's a danger that something is going to be looked, then we have to find ways of addressing that issue in itself. And that surely has to be about how do you go about telling the story clearly and simply? How do you also think about the end users and their purpose in music? What will make this valuable in other markets? So there's a real need for a wider engagement on the part of the community that is producing the goods, giving them the opportunity to understand how people value it, but also giving those people that is going to the opportunity or that are buying it the opportunity to understand why it is of such value to the community that's producing it. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> I've just included this because I think it's really important to reflect upon the creative economy in the context of the SDGs. Um, I particularly wanted to pick up on what was Millennium Development Goal 8 and is now SDG 17, um, because I do think this notion of a global partnership is something which is incredibly important. Um, it is something where I think we are slipping back in many parts of uh, the global north at the moment, including here in the UK in terms of our commitment um, in terms of the spending on aid. And I think that this is an area where it would be a great if in actual fact more was being done to lobby governments to direct some of their aid in terms of the creative economy and its development, because it's one of the real gaps. It certainly has been a gap as far as the UK is concerned. And I think most countries do not see this as being necessarily something which their aid budget should be funding. But I think it's something which in actual fact is incredibly important in that context. Next slide, please. I've, I wanted to close really by looking at the whole question of contemporary business thinking and how the creative and cultural industries are aligned with that. And I think that one of the things I, I, that, that um, I need to say, first of all, is that whatever business, it's going to be um, uh, impacted by government and by the regulations and taxes. So there's an absolute need for the creative sector to be engaged with government and to explain what its needs are. There's also a real need, and this is often a huge gap, for governments and government officials to better understand the creative economy. There is no exceptionalism. You can't avoid government in this context. And then the other thing which I wanted to pick up on was in part social entrepreneurship, but particularly in the context of the triple bottom line. This is a concept which emerged in the 1990s. But interestingly, the guy who created it originally has just issued a recall in the same way that people do a product recall. And he's done that because he believes that it's not doing what it was meant to do. The triple bottom line is people profit, planet profit. And I think there's an opportunity for the creative sector to really become involved in a conversation, which is about what exactly do we mean by a contemporary business? What do we mean by social entrepreneurship? And why is full cost accounting really important in terms of the way in which uh, businesses should operate? And finally, I wanted to really talk about utilization. Um, and uh, I want to ask a question if, as to whether utilization is necessarily always a bad thing. 
does it actually always demean creativity? Because I can think of examples where actually utilization, where creativity has been taken out of the space where it was used originally, particularly in the context, for example, of mental health or dementia care, and used in a different way, it doesn't demean it at all. It just shows it has a different ability and a different value. And I think we just need to be very careful that we aren't just throwing the baby out with the bathwater when we talk about this, that we, that we, we seem to be afraid, afraid that the secondary value will replace the primary value. And therefore, I think it's important for us to be able to really think about whether or not we need to rethink this relationship and whether or not we can be just more um, uh, realistic about, about the relationship between the creative sector and the market. And finally, I want to just finally end by saying something about the conventions. Um, they're critical. They drive the way in which we talk about the economy. Yes, there are issues there in terms of the division between intangible cultural heritage, cultural heritage and the 2005 convention, but they paved the way towards domestic legislation. And they're critical in terms of amassing uh, at the evidence that we need to analyze faults in the system and ensure that the right sorts of policies are being made and the regulations are being introduced. Thank you very much indeed. Last slide. Thanks, Andrew. There is a comment in the chat, if you can repeat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a, a comment from Sahar Atif and uh, 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 I assume also a question from Michelle. Yeah, I can see that as well. Um, I can see that, that um, I, I, I'll say I agree entirely. I think that, that we really need to think very carefully about how we tell the story of intangible cultural heritage. I think that too often we expect people to understand it without really explaining it well enough. And I think that the great thing about um, digital technology today is that it's fairly simple and easy to do that in ways which actually, um, and uh, it's a great actually area to engage young people in, in terms of working with you to do these things, because um, it's something with the, the use of technology is something which excites them. So I would certainly say that, you know, if we can uh, look at ways in which uh, we can we can use social media campaigns um, and technology more broadly, then that's a great way of actually starting to reach new audiences and making sure that the inherent value that Sarah is understood but also so that you can have a better understanding of what it is that people appreciate about the work that you're producing. And then who's going to nurture a creative entrepreneur? I think this is something which government has to be able to step in and do. And I think that it's something which in actual fact, um, we need to be doing more of through um, international organizations and agencies. Um, we used to run a, a, a big training program at the British Council around entrepreneurship in the for, for creative entrepreneurs. Uh, when I was there, but we stopped doing that in about, or the British Council stopped doing that in about 2015. It still does some things around creative entrepreneurship, um, but um, there is, um, and I've done projects and programs with UNESCO, uh, most recently um, in Pakistan, um, looking at the whole question of creative entrepreneurship and providing training. But I think it's one of those things which we really need to develop um, as much as we can do, because it's a critical part in this process. Um, entrepreneurship isn't just something that happens. You need to develop the skills. And for creative entrepreneurs, yes, those are business skills, but there's a far wider range of skills that you need to have, which really allow you to work with creative people. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question? Otherwise we'll move to our next session and Andrew, you will be the moderator for the next session. Indeed. So I'm um, picking up on uh, where I was a moment ago. I'm just going to start off by introducing very briefly each of the panelists uh, this afternoon. I would nearly said morning, but it's morning for me, but it's afternoon for you. I know that. Um, and then uh, but I'll give a, a slightly longer introduction to each of them before they, they speak. So the, the panel is made up of um, and uh, I hope you can see them as we go around. Uh, Chetrim Dorji, who is from uh, Bhutan and the Agency for Promotion of Indigenous Craft. Hava Nazla, who is the Director General of the National Centre for Cultural Heritage in Maldives. Anne-Marie de Silva, 
who's an independent researcher on crafts, artisan and state institutions um, in Sri Lanka, but is based at the moment here in the UK. Uh, Damara Shakya, who is a member of the Nepal Academy of Fine Arts, a former president of the Federation of Handicraft Associations in Nepal. Zaim Makub Khan, who is the executive director of student affairs and external relations at Beacon House National University in Pakistan. And that's an organization which I've done work with in the past for UNESCO. Ananya Bhattacharya, who is the director of Bangla, Bangla Natak, um, com in India, our hosts today. And uh, Michelle Aziz Ahmad, who's an independent promoter of high craftsmanship and the founder of MIAA, which is based in Bangladesh. And our first speaker is going to be, I'll be there, yep, um, Jetram Dodji. Um, he's the communications officer at APIC in Bhutan, has been in that role since 2017. Um, his uh, area of work is around marketing and he's worked for the National Assembly of Bhutan and the Royal University of Bhutan um, um, is a graduate of the Shrubitse College and has been tr trained in research methodology. Over to you, Chetrim. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Chetrim Dodji, as uh, Dr. Andrew uh, introduced. Uh, I work as a communication officer with uh, uh, Agency for Promotion of Indigenous Craft. Uh, So uh, Agency for Promotion of Indigenous Craft was established in 2011 as an organization that promotes equitable growth of handicraft through enhancement of skills and business knowledge of craft community with emphasis on innovation, product de development, and marketing. So these three areas are the main focus that we uh, uh, try to achieve in the agency. So like I said, his, uh, the EPIC, uh, the agency is established in 2011 to commemorate the royal wedding of His Majesty the Fifth King, uh, Jigme uh, Kesar Namge uh, And uh, we function as a semi-autonomous agency, but uh, uh, recently we got an autonomy uh, to function directly under the Ministry of Economic Affairs, uh, guided by Technical Advisory Committee. So we are directed by the government in 2011 to support and develop the country's craft community. So we have uh, carried out uh, the activities broadly under that six, the role of EPIC. So we have to establish an authentic business craft market uh, here in the capital. Then we have to develop uh, craft cluster, clusters in the community, then market linkages and platforms, promotion and preservation of Buddhist arts and craft. Then we have to innovate and design, and then we have to provide training. So these are the main roles that we are trying to do uh, we have achieved a lot uh, since 2011. <clears throat> so uh, the main activities that we have at the moment is we have two of five year plan and we have a supplementary activities. Now in the two of five year plan, we are tasked to set up new craft clusters, enhance capacity of the existing craft, craft clusters. Then we have the enhancement of raw material banks. We have to develop training need assessment to see which is which training that we have provided is useful or not. So we have to give training according to the needs of the artisan. Then we also have, uh, like I mentioned, we have to train the artisans and craft dealers as well as uh, as well as craft dealers to develop a market linkages between them. Then we have marketing and promotion, and we have innovation and design. But unfortunately, due to COVID uh, pandemic, we have uh, the budget has been uh, reduced due to reprioritization of our five-year plan. So now we are carrying out the activities under supplementary uh, activities, which include EU Bhutan trade support uh, from 2018 to 2021. But uh, due to pandemic, this has been pushed to 2022 or 23. I, I'm not 100% uh, sure. Then we have integrated. Uh, enhanced integrated framework to support the uh, craft clusters in construction of uh, common facility centers. And we have CSI flagship program, which also caters to the construction of CFCs, training, product diversifications. So these are the main activities that the agency is carrying out at the moment. 
So uh, to go with the, the arts and craft of Bhutan, and now uh, in Bhutan we call it Zorichusun. It is uh, art of making, the science of making. So that's literal definition. And the Buddhist arts and craft are all rooted in the religion. So uh, we have, uh, in Bhutan we have 13 arts and crafts. We have a lot, but then all are categorized under 13 arts and crafts. So we have uh, 13. So there are seven of them which I have marked in red. The uh, first is calligraphy, painting, sculpture, carving, paper making, embroidery, and casting. These are all considered to be most prestigious in society because uh, this was first practiced in the religion, religious institution. It all came down with the religion, Buddhism. So because of its uh, nature, in, uh, nature uh, attached to the religion, is religious institution, these are cons uh, considered prestigious uh, in, uh, in olden times. Even to this day, if you are a painter or a calligrapher or sculptor, you are, you are respected in the society. Then we have weaving, carpentry, bamboo, or again weaving, goldsmith and uh, silver. Then we have blacksmith and masonry. So this constitutes the 13 arts and crafts of Bhutan. <clears throat> so in Bhutan, we have <clears throat> uh, institutions that caters to training the youths in arts and crafts of Bhutan. So in Bhutan, we have two uh, government-owned institutions. One is National Institute of Zorichusun, which is in Tashiyangtse, established in 1997. Uh, for everybody's information, Tashiyangtse is about uh, two days journey by vehicle from the capital. So it was established as an institute in 1997 and upgraded to college uh, recently. I think it has been only about two years. Then we have an institute of Zorichusun here in the capital, which was established in 1971 which uh, these institutes, one college and the institute are looked after by uh, Ministry of Labor and Human Resources. Then we have a privately owned uh, uh, institute, uh, Chuki School of Traditional Arts, which is located here in the capital. So currently we have three Zorichusum that caters to the need for, to train the youths. So, <clears throat> Uh, as I talk about <clears throat> the uh, economic benefit, uh, I'll go into that. Uh, economic benefits from arts and craft. We have to look at the GNS philosophy. Now, GNS philosophy was um, coined by His uh, Majesty the Pope Dugyabo in, uh, in around 1972. When asked by a journalist, uh, he said about GDP, he said, GNS is more important than GDP. GDP. So according to His Majesty, uh, the fifth king, uh, GNH is simply development uh, values, value of kindness, equality, and humanity. humanity. So we have four uh, pillars of GNH, and I will not go into detail. The one of the pillars is preservation and promotion of cultures, which the agency uh, is currently focusing on. So, uh, then we have uh, uh, nine domains, uh, which I have marked here, culture, diversity, uh, diversity and resilience. So EPIC, uh, uh, the plans and activities of EPICs are all in aligned with the GNH philosophy because uh, government has decided that every plan, every development activities of the country should be based on the four pillars and in 2000, are screened against GNS, GNH policy screening program. So if your activities is affecting the promotion and preservation of culture, your plan is rejected. If it is going against any of the pillars, uh, the plan is uh, rejected. So uh, uh, in Bhutan, every plan is uh, checked whether it uh, qualifies to promote uh, the four pillars of GNH. Now, epic at a glance, <clears throat> the main focus is uh, economic benefits of you know, arts and craft to the Buddhist people. So, so far we have trained around 1,854 people uh, uh, in the area to revive dying arts, to promote and to innovate. So we have uh, trained, uh, trained uh, in natural painting, uh, pigment uh, coloring, 
Then we have woodwork, tin and bamboo, calligraphy, packaging to list some few. And uh, we have given the trainings, around 500 of them, to uh, inmates of central prison here in Timpu uh, and uh, women prison uh, in Paro. So this will in, uh, enable them to be skilled uh, after their uh, release from the uh, prison. Then we have cluster group. In Bhutan, in the olden days, people, for example, uh, textile weavers, they used to practice themselves in their house alone. And the skill is passed from parents to daughter, or parents to children. So uh, in, with the aim that we, uh, we decided that they need to share their skills with other weavers, for example. So we have established clusters. So we have eight textile clusters, two canyon bamboo, two metal clusters, four metal weaving, two woodwork, one wood turning, one cotton weaving, one painting, one natural dye, and one stone, uh, stone carving. So we have 20, uh, three of, uh, 23 cluster group. Then for uh, ease of doing, uh, ease of working, we support them with uh, machines, uh, uh, customized machines, because uh, most of the machines that we explore in India are industrial scale. So it is very huge for them and it's not uh, feasible to transport and utilize that. So they, will, they won't be able to fully utilize that. One. So we have, uh, for example, in cotton weaving, we have uh, supplied customized carding and ginning machine, and we are waiting for some uh, more uh, machines. <clears throat> then we have a raw material bank. Now, the main idea of raw material bank is in Bhutan, it is mountainous and the journey takes a uh, uh, long time. So in order for the artisans to focus their time mostly on their uh, production of handicraft product, we have established six yarn banks seven, uh, two metal banks and one gold and silver for painting. So we have nine raw material banks. We purchase uh, the raw materials uh, in bulk from the gold and silver we uh, purchased from Japan. Then yarn and metal we purchased from India in bulk. We supply to the RMBs that we have in the communities and we have a salesperson there. And <clears throat> we don't charge uh, high fees. Uh, we just calculate the transportation and logistics, and it is very competitive uh, with the shopkeepers. So uh, right now we have nine raw material banks. <clears throat> to gain exposure uh, in uh, from the outside, uh, uh, from international market, we allow uh, artisan. We invite them. We purchase the stall. We give them for free, and uh, we have. So far, we have uh, participation of about 286 uh, in uh, international and national level. So of that 71%, it has national level, 204. We have at international, which is 21%. So we have 82. Total, we have 286. Then uh, for marketing uh, the products by the uh, rural artisans, we have established uh, 85 craft stalls here in the capital. This, uh, like I mentioned, it's outlet for rural handicraft. We, meet, we let them meet the producers and the vendors here. We promote uh, buyer to buyer, buyer to seller meet, and we uh, try to eliminate the middlemen. So in that craft stalls, we have 85 of them. We only allow goodness made products to be sold there. So the, the rental fee for that is uh, near term 4,500 per month, which is about $61. And with the onset of pandemic, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, we are uh, directed by the government to waive off the rent uh, since July 2020. So I, uh, the uh, circular continues, uh, circular says that we have to waive off the rent till uh, July 2022. So we have uh, not been collecting rent due to uh, uh, border closures. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> then we have publications to promote and preserve. Now we have to preserve and then impart the knowledge of arts and craft of Bhutan to the younger generation so they will be aware and they will take interest in that art. So we have published uh, cane and bamboo catalog in 2012, woodworks in 2013, metalworks in 2014, 
weaving and textile in 2014. Then we have published painting in 2016. And we have arts and craft at the time, which was first published in 2017. Then we have published the second edition in 2020. Now we have distributed uh, the arts, uh, the, the catalogs to almost 200 and 200, almost about 200 uh, higher secondary schools in the country. <clears throat> the main uh, product that is gaining more popularity uh, at this moment is uh, EU Bhutan Trade Support. Under the EU Bhutan Trade Support, we have textile export to about uh, about 28 clients in eight countries, uh, which uh, uh, as of now, we have exported around 1,168 textiles. Textile with the sale total of uh, 43,330 euros. That was back in January uh, this year. So I think uh, they have uh, increased. I think the total sale figure is around 500 euros. Uh, so we have uh, countries like Switzerland, France, Germany, Belgium, United Kingdom, Japan, US, and Netherlands. Ketram, I'm sorry, but uh, your time is up. Oh, sorry. Can you come to an end for us, please? Is that okay? Okay. I, I, can I don't know this is the last slide? Well, uh, very quickly then, just skip through it. Okay. So in Bhutan, we have a lot of challenges. We have inconsistent quality. Uh, people are not uh, able to make market study, uh, market study and supply the products accordingly. We, have, we don't have adequate infrastructures and common facility centers. Then we have, we, uh, the artisans lack a capacity to handle bulk orders. Then, like I mentioned, we are not fully mechanized. So that is uh, one limitation. Then packaging is uh, a major issue. Then the main issue that we have is import of products from neighboring countries. We have imitated products, uh, the, uh, um, imitated products from country, uh, neighboring countries, which uh, really hampers the market share for the rural artisans. And we have limited raw material. The raw materials uh, for cane and bamboo wood is not a big, big issue, but for metals and yarn and uh, gold, which uh, comes from India and Japan. And with the onset of pandemic, uh, this has been really a big issue for us. We cannot uh, supply timely raw materials to the uh, uh, raw material bank. So these are the main challenges. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you. And if you come to Bhutan, please visit the craft stores. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Trim. It was very interesting. Um, I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions towards the end of the session uh, for us to be able to put to you and for others, uh, others as well. Right, I think the next person that's coming up, if I'm correct, is Hava Nazla, who is um, the Director General of the National Centre for Cultural Heritage in the Mal Maldives. She has two masters, uh, um, one from the INTI University in Malaysia, which is a master's in business administration, but she also has a master's from the University of Hertfordshire in the UK. And I gather that she's currently a doctoral candidate for a business administration with a focus on cultural heritage tourism. Um, she's got a lot of experience of over seven years worth of experience of working um, in this agenda. And uh, over to you, uh, Nazla. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Andrew. Um, my topic today is, I hope you're seeing my slides. You yeah. can, don't worry. Uh, my topic today is uh, the role of ICH in boosting cultural tourism in the Maldives. Um, the nation of Maldives is home to more than 1,100 islands each, just as culturally richer as another. Even today, Maldivian people continue to live off the land and stick to, that, to, our, to our traditional ways because of the way the Maldivian natives have lived for centuries has changed. Uh, very little craftsmanship is very important to our culture. Uh, Maldives is home to some of the most uh, skilled craftsmen in the world. Trades and skills were passed down uh, from a generation to the next over several centuries and eventually led to the perfection of the Maldivian art as it is known today. Um, intangible cultural heritage is defined in the cultural Her heritage regulation um, 
it is divided into the six elements that you can see on the slide right now. I will not go through each uh, slide. Uh, my presentation will focus more on um, the fifth one, the traditional craftsmanship. Um, uh, I will just very quickly show you some of the few uh, traditional crafts of the motifs, like the lacquer work, uh, locally known as Leela Jehung, the Khoya rope making, um, the mat weaving, um, the kasabo. Kasabo is the uh, the neckline of the traditional dress in the Maldives, um, uh, the jewelry making, and there, there's a lot more like the sarong. Um, the, if I look it into the challenges, um, the if I look at into the challenges uh, the craftsman faces uh, with when dealing with modern markets and consumers, uh, Maldives is a geographically dispersed country. Uh, for example, Gaftal Gaddu et al. women uh, weave the in increasingly popular tundukuna that you can see on the screen, um, the mats, uh, the reeds used um, as raw materials. Uh, uh, to to weave these mats are gathered from another island uh, it, it called Fiori, and then return to Gaddu. Uh, we have to transport it to Gaddu to dry dye and um, dye in a wide variety of natural colors. And then uh, once the reed are ready, they are handed over to the weavers. And once the mat is ready, we have to again take it to another island to actually um, sell them. So uh, the country being geographically dispersed has a huge a vast number of challenges uh, to the motives the to the skilled skilled workers um the skills to weave the intricate reed mats are also fading as people leave the island for the capital city not just the mats the lacquer work the ich craftsmen uh, craft crafts as a whole uh, is fading because people leave the island for the capital city to be closer to schools, uh, to be closer to, closer to the services. Uh, we need to establish to establish mechanisms to encourage artists to continue uh, uh, the safeguard in these practices, to continue practicing these crafts. Uh, it is uh, also difficult for us to ensure authenticity because we lack uh, documentation and research in traditional crafts. Uh, at the moment, we do not even have uh, a proper inventory of the uh, intangible cultural heritage of the Maldives. Uh, Maldives is fairly new to the ICH. Uh, so the, NC the, the National Center for Cultural Heritage or NCCH we are currently working on um, uh, compiling a list, uh, preparing a list, uh, an inventory list of the ICH. So uh, we don't know uh, if the products are counterfeit or if it's original or because we have a handful of people practicing these uh, crafts. Um, the youth engagement uh, in the ICH field is low, mainly because they do not earn enough um, through locally made crafts. Uh, Although um, there are one or two young people that have uh, recently started um, with innovative products like they 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 the 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 kasabo bahida they've started making bracelets out of the neckline um, the kasabo that I showed you earlier so there there are one or two people who have just recently uh, started uh, in, uh, practicing this in innovative ways. Um, to support the craftsmen, uh, it is important to establish a smooth engagement mechanism between the communities. At the moment, a lot of communities are disengaged. Um, the, 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 they lack communication, like for example, the islands that send raw materials to the island that actually does the work are not does not have a proper me communication mechanism established so uh, it's important to establish a smooth engagement between the countries between the islands i'm sorry it is also important to establish cooperative societies active um, cooperative societies that will work on reviving uh, the crafts well known to the islands um, we also need to create marketing opportunities and platforms for those artists 
to sell their products and make a living out of it. Um, NCCH is now working on establishing a souvenir shop at the Nationals Museum that will only be selling authentically lo authentic locally made products. Um, this could uh, be a platform for the craftsmen, uh, a way uh, to encourage marketing authentic products. Um, we need to strengthen the link of ICH to tourism, perhaps establish a link between uh, nearby resorts with the island craftsmen so the tourists can get access to the locally made products. Um, tourism is um, the largest economic industry in the Maldives. Um, it plays a crucial role in generating employment, earning foreign exchange revenues, and is the main source of income to the country. Um, tourism is vital in the ongoing development of the Nation, although COVID-19 pandemic brought global tourism and travel to a standstill, and the economic consequences have been devastating to the Maldives, um, the tourism industry in the Maldives is uh, slowly picking up now. So cultural heritage and ICH is another factor that could drive more tourists um, to, the to the country as well. Um, like I said, tourism is one way to establish a sustainable relationship between ICH and economic utilization. The Maldives can further promote local island tourism and introduce community-based tourism. The tourism that is being promoted in the Maldives is more uh, one island, one uh, I, uh, you, you, the tourists will experience isolation, uh, they, they, they'll be in one island, so they don't get to experience the, uh, the local food or the local, uh, the Maldivian way of life. So perhaps introducing uh, the community tourism, uh, instead of going to a resort and staying isolated, tourists can uh, see how Maldivians live, enjoy our crafts, taste our food, uh, learn, perhaps learn our language and so on. Um, the government is also now in the talks of uh, introducing homestay, uh, which is another way for tourists to enjoy um, Maldivian local life. They can actually stay and live with uh, Maldivian families. Um, to the date, uh, the Maldives has primarily and mainly focused on promoting the sun, sand and sea of the country. Uh, we have indeed gained a lot of momentum promoting this aspects. However, if we explore cultural tourism avenue, I'm sure there's a lot of scope for economic developments. Um, thank you. I'm open for questions if you have any. Thank you very much indeed, Nazla. That's very kind. Um, I think um, we are uh, going to be taking questions at the end. Um, I'm, I will wait for somebody to indicate if I'm wrong about that. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And I think we're now therefore going to move on to um, uh, Anne-Marie de Silva, um, who is from Sri Lanka. Um, she's a public policy analyst uh, with experience of working in uh, think tanks, research consultants and government. Her areas of expertise are in cultural policy, labor and work and gender. In the area of culture, she's published studies on Sri Lanka about censorship and creative artists, multilingual lingual liter literary histories, the handicrafts economy, and um, the potential for Sri Lanka to pivot to a creative economy approach. Um, her work has been widely published and she's undertaken work for organizations like the British Council. She has an MA in South Asian Area Studies from SOAS in London, um, where she was a Chevening Scholar. Over to you, Anna Marie. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me all right? Fab, okay. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Anne-Marie De Silva, um, and I'll be taking you through uh, the, kind, the landscape of economic opportunities for traditional crafts in Sri Lanka. So what I'm going to do is talk to you a bit about the public sector, um, the non-profit sector, and then, um, and also private sector, and just kind of wrap it up at the end. Uh, I don't have a presentation because I thought it would be nice, it's a short presentation, I thought it would be nice to just speak to you, um, rather than having everyone concentrate on too many things. Um, but I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, similar to a lot of other post-colonial countries, um, the traditional crafts were revived as part of a cultural revival um, in the post-independence era as a means of kind of reifying uh, national identities, but also it became um, an important economic opportunity for the rural areas. So there were trading programs that were created, hand looms um, and factories, um, the kind of workstations created around the country because it did it did present a good economic opportunity. 
Um, and so these ad hoc uh, interventions kind of uh, eventually uh, became, um, you know, took, took on state sponsorship and the state created three uh, departments that were uh, that were given the responsibility of promoting and protecting handicrafts, um, any type of tr traditional crafts. So there were three. One was uh, given the responsibility of working on the research and design aspect. Um, the second was uh, looked mostly um, at the development of the crafts workers themselves. So looking at looking after their welfare, but also their skills development um, and supporting the the supply chain aspects, things like raw material acquisitions. And a final arm was established uh, called, which was the Sri Lanka Handicrafts Board, which is known as Luxala um, back then and now as well. Um, and that handled the sales and marketing aspect of it. So these three organizations that are referred to as, as the allied institutions um, were created to uh, stabilize kind of an, an environment in which traditional crafts could thrive. And it did really well um, during that time when it was established in the 60s um, and it still functions now. But in the 60s and 70s, it really thrived. Uh, it created great op training opportunities for craftsmen to get involved, um, learn new crafts, have new livelihoods opportunities. Um, it supported the, so the supply chain aspects, as I said. Um, it also supported the business pipeline um, up to the point of even marketing and sales. Um, now, context matters in this sense, though, because all of this was happening within a closed economy um, context in Sri Lanka. So you had a captive market where you don't have c competition from other fabrics, some um, other other consumer um, products. So you had a really you had a flourishing um, economy for, for traditional craftspeople at this time. Now, Sri Lanka changed its economic policy from 1977 onwards, and we opened up. And what that meant was a flood of cheaper alternatives. So where somebody would use rattan for their homewares, they might now use the cheaper plastics that were offered. Um, there, there were cheaper fabrics, uh, materials, um, threads, textiles, just a flood of you know, cheaper, more accessible um, alternatives. And it, it became a situation where local craftsmen couldn't, um, couldn't compete. So where, whereas you businesses and consumers would otherwise looked at traditional craftsmen, they now had um, an easier opportunity um, from what was coming in from, uh, from overseas, from imports. Now the allied institutions, as I said, they still exist, um, but they're very minimally adapted to this new open economic um, environment. And so in a sense, it has become in many ways defunct and it hasn't kept up with the times and hasn't been able to support um, crafts workers nor support the business environment um, to continue flourishing in the way that it has before. Uh, the other important aspect in this is that there was rampant corruption um, in these in the state enterprises as well. So for example in the early 2010s uh, Laxala, the, the handicrafts board, um, the marketing arm recorded losses of 20 million rupees um, and craftsmen for, for several years, um, craftsmen who had previously had really good relationships with, um, uh, with the Handicrafts Board started saying that, you know, they, they were waiting six months, eight months to receive a payment of, you know, 40,000 rupees, which is the equivalent of about USD 300. Um, and so relationships deteriorated because money was being mishandled. Um, in 2011 and 2000, between 2011 and 2013, uh, Laxala recorded administrative costs of 45% to 60%. So this is all money that is not getting sent to, um, that is not being used to fulfill um, purchase orders. So there, there, was a, there was a gamut of corruption that was happening here, which led to the deterioration of, an other, of a previously um, well-functioning state unit. But the thing is, what you have then is the context of a dependency relationship that's built up. Uh, crafts workers who have otherwise depended and you know, successfully depended on, on state infrastructure to support their skills development and marketing um, continue to, to have that dependency. Um, and you also have gov the government sector looking now at this deteriorating industry as, as a charitable venture. So when I was doing my research and I was speaking to some government officials, um, I have this quote from one of them which in, he said it to me in Singhala, but it translates essentially to, if you let go of these workers, if you, le if you let go of the crafters, they'll fall through the cracks. So it's, it's kind of a patronizing um, charitable attitude towards workers instead of recognizing actually what 
what a potent, what potential there is in this sector. And the thing is, it is there is a lot of potential. When there was a governance change in the Handicrafts Board um, in 2017, they managed to, uh, within a, I think within the span of a year, they managed to um, fulfill all of the back payments of, um, of the workers. And by 2017, they recorded a pre-tax profit of 30 million rupees. Um, so that's after uh, paying administrative costs, after paying, um, <clears throat> after paying the handicrafts workers as well, they still made 30 million rupees. And that's not a small amount. Um, and this, this grew over the years. So it's it is profitable. It is it's commercially viable. Um, the other the other testament to the to the commercial viability of it is that one of the governors who was who had corruption allegations um, charged against him, um, who the governors of the handicrafts board, after he left, um, he created his own private company that was um, another handicrafts company, and that has uh, its retail outlets are in prime locations in Colombo. Um, so clearly, there's enough money in it for him to start a new business, have enough money to rent prime locations. So the point is, there is, the industry itself is lucrative, but because of the, the money that's been mishandled by, by government, um, the impression that people have now is that craft workers are, are a charitable cause, that we need to support them as a charity and not giving them the integrity of, um, of, of what, we what we should owe to workers and business people. Um, now, this charitable attitude also uh, brings me to my next point about the role of nonprofits um, in in traditional crafts. So, local and foreign NGOs um, have come to Sri Lanka, and they, in in, in order to address livelihoods problems, um, what they'll often do is support upskilling for cottage industries. So, so things that you can do at home, so you know, livestock rearing, but also very much crafts. Um, now that's that's great, but there is there hasn't been support for, for for the marketing aspect of it, nor has there been a real kind of um, holistic support for the entire supply chain aspect of it from from raw material acquisition up to the point of sale. So what you have is um, a group of people who low income people who now have a set of skills, but they have and they can make things, but they they don't know how to cost things. They don't have a market that's easily accessible to them. Don't understand those. Um, or don't have access to the knowledge to, to train themselves to, to be better marketers um, or even access to that to the market in the first place. Um, so that becomes a problem as well and it's still seen as a charitable um, venture. The other thing is now this attitude of upskilling people, vulnerable people specifically, um, comes from the idea of uh, depending on a micro entrepreneurship model. So giving up a person skills or resources and expecting them essentially to sew or to weave themselves out of poverty. Now, it seems illogical to try to use a micro entrepreneurship model when it comes to a vulnerable population because entrepreneurship rests fundamentally on the ability to, it's a risky business. It, 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 it relies on risk and risk in um, assumes that you have capital to lose. Now, vulnerable people do not have capital to lose, not, not financial capital, they're very limited social capital. Um, and yet this micro-entrepreneurship attitude that's kind of been um, uh, spearheaded by, by the nonprofit sector is now a predominant way that um, even governments and, and other actors, social businesses as well, will try, will try to approach um, the craft sector. So that attitude itself is, is a problem um, and it's not sustainable to support crafts. Um, the third aspect of this, um, which has a slightly <laughs> happier tone, um, is the private sector. Um, now, there are a f there's quite a variety of private sector actors. You have some long-standing businesses um, who have been in operation for, for a couple of decades. You have a couple of um, newer high-end retailers um, and design, you know, high-end like uh, haute couture. Um, high design homewares kind of brands. And you also have um, in the past kind of decade, you've got a flourishing of, of startups uh, that are also interested in reviving traditional crafts, but in, um, in, in a way that's relevant to the, to the contemporary market. So there's a couple of actors. Um, and when I've spoken to crafts workers, um, so from a variety of crafting, let's say reed work or, or lace or, or fabrics or any of that, um, the relationship with private sector actors has generally been good. You know, they, they say they've got timely payments, they're getting good payments for what they're producing. Um, and 
they also feel challenged um, because the requests that, that are coming in from the private sector require them to do new designs, learn new skills in order to fulfill, to do the fulfillments. Um, to, uh, so the designers will come in and like teach them new, um, new ways of doing this because that's the product that they want. And so there's kind of a natural upskilling that's going on just because just out of sheer consumer demand. Um, so they generally have really good, um, uh, yeah, good interactions with, with some of these um, higher end um, private sector actors. There are downsides to this though, um, downsides to the role of the private sector. First and foremost, there are only a few businesses. There's not nearly enough businesses um, to be able to really um, you know, support the crafts community as a whole. The other thing is these businesses are generally linked to the tourism sector, which, it, which in itself is a fickle economy. Um, when I was writing the, the, um, this particular study on, on handicrafts, I was writing this in 2019, and it flagged the fickleness of the of the tourism economy and i mean the pandemic happened which obviously you know that that was just a, things just came to a grinding halt for for tourism and it's been this way for the past year in sri lanka but even outside of the pandemic the sri lankan political situation is also not stable enough to be able to depend on tourism seasonal tourism there's a way that you can plan for, for seasonal tourism even though it's not a year round thing but political instability in sri lanka means that it's not just you know, natural disasters or um, uh, like ad hoc things like the pandemic um, that create that instability. The tourism sector is fundamentally um, unstable. So when you've got businesses that are tied to that, that leaves the crafts workers vulnerable as well. And the final downside to the, to the private sector is ultimately the private sector is gonna be driven by what is consumable, what is, what is marketable. And that does not fulfill the, the role that something like the government ought to play um, in protecting and promoting crafts. Um, so there is still, and ultimately the, the private sector also, um, they, there's no responsibility also um, to look specifically after the, the welfare of the workers either. You know, that's generally more the gamut of, um, that's more in the ambit of, of the private sector, sorry, the, the public sector or, or nonprofits. So, I mean, getting timely payments and good payments means that workers themselves are better able to take care of themselves. But the point is, all these different actors have different responsibilities, um, and they have rather they have roles to play. But the point, but, but the problem is, there hasn't been an adequate adaptation of each of their roles to the current reality of of crafts workers, the current um, reality of our economy, um, and there just needs to be essentially a revamping and a different um, attitude really to to crafts workers. They are definitely not a charitable sector. These are um, you know, the intellectual potential that, that lies there is, is, is incredible. Um, the commercial value is, it's, it is viable. Um, so there's, there's definitely ways to revamp the, um, this sector so that it, it benefits the workers. Um, it works to continue to protect our crafts um, and just elevates this to, to the potential, uh, elevates it and um, fulfills the potential that it, that it actually has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. That was very interesting, very interesting indeed. Um, I said we'll take questions at the end. So um, I, uh, so when we get to the, that bit, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you, um, lots there to think about. And um, so next, we're going to move on to uh, Dharma Raj Shakya. I think that's right. Yep, here we go. Um, he's a member of the Nepal Academy of Fine Arts and a former president of the Federation of Handicraft Associations. <laughs> in Nepal. He's uh, got a Master of Fine Arts from, um, uh, I'll get this pronunciation wrong, I'm sure, Tribhuvan uh, University in Kirtipur from 2013, an MA in Nepalese History, Culture and Archaeology um, from 2001. He's also a PGD in Buddhism from the Tribhuvan University. Um, he's an artist, painter and sculptor and proprietor of Arnico Stone Carving. Over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Andrew, for my introduction. Uh, my name is Dharmara Sakya. Uh, I am member of Council Member of Nepal Academy of Fine Arts. Um, today's my topic is handicraft contribution to Nepali economy. Uh, handicraft is a 
uh, one of major domain uh, of uh, ICH, Intangible Culture Heritage. So my presentation is focused on handicraft. Uh, first of all, uh, handicraft at glance. Uh, handicrafts are handmade creation. It is made by uh, hand and it is useful and decorative objects which are made completely by hand and very a few uh, machine uh, use uh, simple uh, you uh, there here is a uh, using only simple tools it is usually traditional way of making various genera of arts and craft it applies to wide range of creative and design activities that are related to making things with one's hand art and skills uh, handicraft uh, making handicrafts require specialized and traditional knowledge and skill and technology in in nepal we have more than 42 kind of different handicraft products are being exported to more than 60 different countries uh, uh, now in nepal the major handicrafts are exports are uh, pasmina woolen product felt product silk silk natural fibers metal craft silver jewelry handmade paper uh, wood craft ceramic products thanka uh, painting and stone carving and many more and major importers countries are uh, usa germany china india japan uk canada australia denmark and these are the major market for nepalese handicrafts and uh, nepali handicrafts are more than 10 billion nepali rupees is exporting from nepal to different countries and domestic sales is also 10 billion uh, nepali rupees and there okay. is a can i interrupt you for a second your slides aren't moving forward so please say if you want them to if you, you need to advance your slides um, okay you uh, sorry sorry that's fine don't worry no no i just thought that you might be a bit lost otherwise yeah. uh i okay i i start again it is a uh, handicrafts or handmade creation uh, which is useful and and decorative objects which are made completely by hand or by using only simple tools are using it is usually a traditional way of making various genera of arts and craft it applies to a wide range of creative and design activities that are related to making things with one's hand art and skills uh, making handicraft requires specialized and traditional knowledge, skill, and techni techniques. In Nepal, uh, we have more than 42 kind of different handicraft products, which are being exported to more than 60 different countries. Uh, major handicraft exports are uh, pasmina, woolen, woolen product, felt, uh, felt product, silk, natural fibers, metal craft, silver jewelry, handmade paper, uh, wood craft, ceramic products, thanka, stone carving, and many more. And uh, major importers countries are uh, like USA, Germany, China, India, Japan, UK, Canada, Australia, Denmark, and uh, ETC are the major market for Nepalese handicrafts. They, they, these countries are uh, love countries people's love uh, nepalese handicrafts and export and employment are uh, 
10 billion dollar uh, uh, sorry 10 billion nepali rupees uh, uh, are export to overseas different countries and 10 billion nepali rupees uh, handicraft products sales in domestic market in uh, nepal nepali market and there is a uh, 1.2 million peoples are directly and indirectly employment in uh, nepal in uh, handicraft is uh, very popular in uh, nepal and uh, there is a uh, lalitpur is one of the very uh, famous for handicraft uh, product handicraft city the, the, this city is a uh, more than 2000 years old city uh, it is uh, still this city is a uh, very uh, famous for uh, craft uh, craftsman's city recently in 16 october 2018 lalitpur city has been recognized as the world craft city by world craft council asia pacific region and uh, this is uh, to gain this prestigious re uh, recognition for lalitpur this uh, work the uh, fn fn it means federation of handicraft association has exercise extensively since a decade for the, uh, declaring the Lalitpur as a world craft city. And uh, in Lalitpur, there is a, uh, one tool, one uh, product, uh, like a, a riches, richness art and craft of Lalitpur, accordingly local, locality. It is very famous to Lalitpur, uh, like a, Pinche Bahal is a uh, famous for stone carving. There is a uh, settle the stone carver are, uh, are uh, living there. And Oku Bahal is a metal craft. Bhungamati is a wood craft. Jom Bahal is a wood, uh, wood craft. Uh, Tangal is a metal utensil. Uh, metal uh, Haugal is metallic utensil. Gabal is a silver jewelry and gold smiths. And Bhubal is also silver and gold uh, gold smiths. And Nagwal is a uh, filigree and metal crafts. Are, uh, these are very famous tools. Uh, there is some uh, following has been supporting on handicraft sectors of Nepal. This is, these are some uh, organization. Uh, for example, Federation of Handicraft Association is private sector and Nepal Academy of Fine Arts, uh, Lalitpur Handicraft Association and some district association is also here uh, in Nepal, which is associated with Federation of Handicraft Association, like a uh, Baglung Handicraft Association, Bajura Handicraft Association, uh, Bara Handicraft Association, Paktapur Handicraft Association, Dang Handicraft Association, Handicraft Association of Chapa, Handicraft Association of Palpa, Kaski Pokhara Handicraft Association, Makwanpur Handicraft Association, Ramechap Handicraft Association, Sankhwa Sabha Handicraft Association, Sarlahi Handicraft association and Taplizung handicraft association these are uh, district handicraft association and and another uh, uh, association which is uh, uh, working with working for handicraft products uh, these are uh, commodity association uh, nepal handmade paper association nepal posmina industries association woodcraft association of nepal Footwear Manufacturer Association of Nepal, Nepal Ceramic Association, Export Council of Nepal, Fair Trade Group Nepal, uh, Nepal Wool Felt Producers and Exporter Association, National Micro Entrepreneurs 
Federation at Nepal, Ulan Development Association, Handicraft, uh, Grass, Glass Udyog Professional Association of Nepal. And this is a uh, export data of uh, Nepal. Uh, this year, uh, uh, only two two hundred crores sixty two hundred sixty crore uh, Nepali amounts are export from Nepal. Uh, it is based on textile products. Uh, uh, the due to COVID nineteen. And another uh, handicraft product is non textile based industry. Uh, these are three, uh, these are 295, uh, 94 crore Nepali uh, rupees, uh, which is export from Nepal. Uh, uh, in uh, total, is uh, 500 crore, 537 crore, and something are export from Nepal. Uh, this year uh, declining the export figure because of uh, due to uh, due to uh, COVID-19 and here is a picture of handicraft handicraft uh, it is a, a, a context of picture of handicraft and context context in Nepali uh, Nepali Nepal handicrafts and arts are abstract and very meaningful uh, product which is uh, belong to uh, uh, buddhism and hinduism religions and skill and arts is transmitted to generation to generation it is uh, teaching to forefather teach to his uh, dear sons and they are also continuing uh, this uh, uh, system a traditional culture expression uh, in appearance its design and style and handicraft are expression that are symbolic of the artisans cultural and social society handicraft are cultural historical and social accept of society and and nation handicraft has business prospect can be exported and consumed their distinct features can be utilization utilization aesthetic artistic creative a cultural attached decorative functional traditional or religiously and soci socially symbolic and significant of handicraft uh, it is uh, which is uh, it is transmitted from generation to generation which is already i talked before Uh, there is uh, so many challenges in promote, uh, uh, promoting in handicraft sector in Nepal. Uh, first of lack of supportive policies and government investment on handicraft sectors and skill and technology termination due to the no transfer from generation to generation because the new generation less interest on traditional art business of young uh, young people and lack of awareness of preservation of arts and crafts the youths are interested to go abroad for studies and foreign employment and another things it is very easily copy and imitated imitated to lower quality machine products uh, mass production machine made products are cheaper than the hand definitely uh, definitely machine made product are very cheaper than the handmade products uh, due to lower income and reputation of artists they have been changing to other occupation uh, highly competitive market between the mass products such as India and China they have new technology and, uh, uh, and so so that and lack of research development for the quality standardization and branding in Nepal 
Is that about it? Because uh, you, I'm afraid you're running out of time, Dharma. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yes, I have a last slide I want to show. Uh, here is some uh, glimpses of Nepali handicraft products. This is uh, this uh, this is the metal craft uh, product, and uh, this is stone craft. This is wood craft of Nepal, and this is a power painting and thanka painting, and this is a allo product, uh, handmade paper decorative uh, glass product and leather product, uh, felt product, crystal, silk, silver jewelry, and cotton wear, pasmina, woolen wear, and, and at last, my presentation is a uh, complete this, uh, Thank you very much. If you have any question, please welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the questions Thank a little you. bit later on, but we need to move on now. And our next presentation is from Zaim Yakub Khan, who is the Executive Director of Student Affairs and External Relations at Beacon House National University in Pakistan. He's got over 17 years experience in Pakistan, serving in different roles in the higher education sector. He has degrees in computer science and development studies, and he's um, only a part of 1% of global learners to earn a micro master's credential in data economics and development policy, an initiative of JPAL. Um, he um, has studied with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology um, and there studied under, new, uh, uh, under the Nobel laureates, uh, Abjit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. And um, he's a longtime passionate supporter of the development of entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial ecosystems, and is bringing all of that to bear in the context of his work on the creative economy. Over to you, Zaim. So I'm going to be talking about the economic potential of intangible cultural heritage in the context of Pakistan. Uh, interestingly, this image. Um, uh, can you see the image? <clears throat> can indeed. Yep, yeah, it's fine. All right. So this is the image of a uh, mausoleum. It's, it's essentially, it's near the city of Lahore where I'm based uh, in the center of the province of Punjab. Mausoleum is that this is to commemorate the, the memory of, uh, of the pet antelope of one of the Mughal emperors. Uh, it's called the Hiran Minar. Uh, it's, um, it's actually built to commemorate uh, Mansraj, which is uh, which is the pet antelope of one of the Mughal emperors. But you see, uh, a monument is essentially nothing without a story. So as you say that a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps an image is worth a thousand stories, and all of these stories uh they basically they are the stories that make uh you know the most important relationship between the intangible and the intangible i'm sorry Zang, you're, uh, you're cutting in and out again, i'm afraid be starting with oh andrew i'm so sorry can you hear hear me better now? No, no, I'm sorry. It's still really distorted. Um, um, I, let me just have a check with um, uh, colleagues here and just see whether or not we can do something to help you uh, sort that out. My apologies, guys. I'm so, so sorry. No, it's not your fault. It's technology. That's the problem with the internet sometimes. It doesn't do what you want it to do. All right, so I'm going to be taking you from the insights that we had from various reports and and then from there, I'm going to build the argument about uh, different creative industries, landscape, different, um, you know, uh, sort of different players and agents, economic agents on the spectrum of culture and creative industries in Pakistan. So let's start with, uh, so the economic potential, uh, there is substantial evidence that in the international outlook, Pakistan features 
the strong technical skills in audiovisual media, interactive media, design, animation, television, photography, festivals and events, they do. And 15% of all employees in Pakistan, they earn their livelihoods uh, in the sectors of cultural and creative economies. And there is a very, very uh, encouraging representation of women uh, in the workforce. I am going to share this table with all of you. As you can see, uh, the figure over here is about 15%. But in provinces like Gunja, which is the largest province, there's about 16%, which is 1% more than uh, the average that you see in the country, right? So banking on this, uh, we basically came up with a program that Andrew and I, we did together, which is Pakistan's investing in Pakistan's creative future program. And we did that in collaboration with UNESCO and the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism of the Republic of Korea. Beacon House National University is the ideal spot for this because we are the only institution in South Asia to have resident students from all eight SAR countries. Um, so we have resident students from all eight SAR countries. And then we realized that, you know, we also have the advantage that we have uh, we have the kind of knowledge base and the milieu uh, is available to us and we are we are best suited to come up with a with a with an entrepreneurial training program in the cultural and creative industries because the eight academic units of the liberal arts university which is beacon house National university uh, we're constantly just looking for ways that we can collaborate different departments and we can see across i mean across the boundaries of the university also look towards the region to find out where synergies can be brought in together to build a more sustainable kind of relationship and uh, perhaps make the economic agency uh, more uh, stimulating. See? So, so on the basis of that, we came up with a five-day training program and it was a pilot, very, very successfully done, uh, tailored to the needs of businesses in Pakistani culture and creative industries. Uh, we had two cohorts at two levels, the startup cohort and the accelerator cohort. The startup cohort was essentially for people who are starting out in the culture and creative industries. But of course, we were looking at a profile. So we, there, was, there was a specific type of a profile of a person that we were looking for. So, <clears throat> The training methodology included, uh, you know, case studies. And here we invoked some of the amazing insights that we were able to get our hands on to by the Indian, uh, Indian American economist, Deb Raj Ray, when he talks about uh, the aspirations gap and aspirations window. So over here, when we came up with the case studies, we selected firms uh, for, for the purpose of case studies who were not the top dog of the industry, but they were, they were so we, we essentially brought the goalposts closer to people in terms of coming up with case studies of people who are more, uh, you know, attainable uh, in the next two, three years. So instead of having the top dog in, the, in, in a specific industry, we selected someone uh, who's been... Uh, or who's just come, you know, uh, halfway, and and then looking at the case studies in terms of their challenges and you know so on and so forth. Uh, the training components included problem solving, intellectual property and legal obligations, finance and accounting, marketing and internationalization. Uh, the trainings were uh, delivered by the faculty of the university, local and international experts, including Andrew Senior, and then we had remote speakers, including. Ken Ro, co-founder of Wealth from the Republic of Korea. Uh, our case studies, as I was telling you, uh, we invoked the insights from Debra Jre and we came up with these four uh, medium level firms, Tintash, which is into game design and development, Olomopolo Media, it's a performing arts firm. Then we have a five perspective case, uh, case study on the Pakistani film and media industry, which included the mainstream film production, to freelancing, to the distributor side of the film, and also the cinemas and theaters. And then we, we had uh, one digital advertising firm by the name of Far 4 uh, And interestingly, most of these organizations that we selected, they have, uh, you know, so they have regional sort of like collaboration as one of the keys to success. For instance, 
Farik Four had their mentors in India, uh, in Bombay, and we had Olomopolo Media, for instance, having uh, their mentoring done by uh, you know lots and lots of uh, international um, storytellers, Dastan Go, for instance, the storytelling tradition that we have in the subcontinent from across the border into India. So we also just looked at uh, the regional collaboration when we were looking for uh, our case study firms. The program was held between 27th November of 27th October and 1st of November 2019. Uh, we opened a call for applications. Uh, very very encouraging response. So we had uh, about the final complete applicants were about 240, and they came from all across Pakistan. 44% uh, from the largest province, which is the province of Punjab, followed by Sindh and then Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Balochistan and Gilgit Baltistan, 4% each, and 7% from the Islamabad capital territory. And then the gender composition of the applicants, very encouraging once again. So we've got about 65% male, 34% female, and then 1% transgender also. Uh, in terms of sector wide, wise representation of the 240 applicants, we had the major uh, you know, chunk of uh, firms applying for this training program uh, were from the design side. And then we had about 15% from cultural management, digital culture and creative industries, and then cinema and audiovisual arts. We also had about 6% in publishing visual arts, 6% in music, and then about 3% in performing arts and media arts. This is the final, uh, these are the final winners, about 12 that we selected. I'm going to just very briefly touch upon their profiles. Uh, so they came to Beacon House National University in Lahore and we held a residential program for them. So the startup cohort, which is for just uh, very, very emerging people who are just starting out, uh, we have these six people. Um, so we have uh, Momin Ali Munshi, uh, Galaxy Lollywood essentially runs a, a Facebook a social media platform. Uh, and then uh, we had Yad Sayyid Muhammad, who basically is uh, running sort of like, um, you know, uh, a sort of a, a platform where he's basically doing uh, streaming of films and indigenously made videos by freelancers. Then we have Heather Ali, who's a trans participant activism through art, so performing arts. We have Neha Jahangir, uh, she's an art therapist. Uh, Zaheb Ramzan Bhatti into mainstream uh, media production. Rehana Abdullati from um, Quetta, Balochistan, which is the smallest province of, the, uh, of, of Pakistan uh, by the name of Lady, uh, Little Lady Films. And in the startup cohort, uh, in the accelerator cohort, which is the, I mean, people who have been in business for at least uh, uh, close to about two years. Uh, we had Luke Rehmat, uh, who runs a, a web news network channel in one of the remotest areas of Pakistan. And then we had Shoaib Iqbal, who does uh, the Little Art uh, Children's Film Festival. Uh, we have Jazeb Saftar Khwaja, uh, who's part of the Karachi Community Radio. It's basically an online uh, internet radio. Uh, Abdullah Khan, who does uh, runs an animation studio uh, for startups. Natasha Nurani, very, very interesting uh, person. Uh, she does the Lahore Music Meet, which is uh, the younger version. I mean, so the people who are drawn towards Music Meet are the younger generation who would otherwise go for all Pakistan music conference. And then we had uh, Shanila Ali Saptan, uh, who's into textile and apparel uh, industry. Uh, so, so this is basically one end of the spectrum. So these are people who are, who are privileged in many ways in terms of education and, you know, sort of like uh, being educated at the urban middle class and so on and so forth. But we also just got some very insightful information in the latest survey, which was conducted uh, by the Bureau of Statistics of the province of Punjab in 2017 and 18 on the women's economic and social well-being. And as you can see, uh, this is the employment by occupation of women. So in terms of different occupations, managers, professional technicians, clerks, service workers, agriculture, skilled, crafts-related trade workers, plant workers, elementary occupations, 
you can see the largest employment by occupation is in agriculture sector, but then after that it's craft and related trades works. So this is basically the intuition and the motivation to go in for another project with UNESCO uh, for the documentation, promotion, and capacity building of culture and creative industries around selected heritage sites in, in Punjab, which is the largest province. It's very overly represented in, our, in the data sets and descriptive statistics that I shared with you earlier. So two of uh, one of uh, the circuits, we call that uh, the region, that we selected these two heritage sites, the Gurdwara, Gurudwara Rodisa in Amnabad, which is in central Punjab, and Gurdwara Sacha Sauda, which is Shekhupur. It's very close to um, uh, the antelope uh, uh, mausoleum that I showed you uh, in the first picture. So both of these were, were identified as heritage sites, and we started doing a mapping exercise around them to see how many tangible and intangible cultural heritage traditions and practices do exist around that. And it's very heartening to see that in this circuit, which is Ravi River in area of Ganjiba, Sandalbar, and the archaeological subzone of the Indus Valley civilization, encompassing the sites of Gurdwara Sachasada and Gurdwara Rori Sab in Imnabad, including three districts, Shekhupura, Gujrawala, and Lahore. Lahore is the second largest city of Pakistan. We had about 60, 61% of these were tangible cultural assets and about 39% intangible and then the further division in terms of the categorization of tangible and intangible in, in, in just intangible cultural heritage so we had about 44 percent knowledge and skills to produce traditional crafts and i would say this is a little overestimation because uh inadvertently i included gastronomy as part of this because uh there are lots and lots of uh practitioners that we found who were privy to, and there was an intergenerational effect over here right. also. So I'm very sorry, but you're running out of time. All right, I'm just going to the... finish very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so we had an intergenerational effect over here in terms of passing on knowledge. And then the second most uh, represented uh, category was festive events. And we did another uh, mapping exercise in south of Punjab, which is, uh, these are two very, very important monuments. The Rawal Fort in Cholistan Desert and Bibi Javindi's complex in Ucharif. And we also did a similar exercise around two uh, very important cities of Punjab. And we found about 23% uh, of these uh, mapped assets were intangible. And then the further categorization of that, as you can see, is about 37% of these. Uh, so 43% were knowledge and skills traditions and 37% for festive events. Now, my argument about it, about intangible cultural heritage, and also after talking with the, with the community and doing focus group discussions, we basically feel, and I, I see a huge scope for invigorating and, you know, sort of like uh, doing a lot of, uh, I mean, so trying to reviving festivals. Most of these festivals and the people, they also said when we met with the communities that the festivals need to be revived. And this is all part of the mandate of uh, ICH to actually look towards the festivals. However, I also propose that we, we look at the impact assessment of these festivals from different aspects. And I was able to actually just pull that out from the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. And in terms of looking at the positive and the negative economic and uh, social uh, impacts of that, also the environmental. And of course, uh, you know, uh, not to just uh, put aside something which is the latest scenario, as, as you know, in the wake of the COVID, um, you know, uh, the situation, the pandemic, and you know, what probably uh, the festivals may have to go through uh, in the light of these new challenges and new normal that we have. Thank you very much indeed, Zaim. Thank you. So we'll come back to questions later on, and I'm going to move on very swiftly, if that's okay, to Ananya Bhattacharya, who uh, we all know from the past, uh, uh, well, from the process of coming along to this event and taking part in it. She's the co-founder and director of Banglantak.com, uh, the social enterprise which uh, is hosting this event, um, and has been working on this agenda really since 2000. Um, 
they work in the context of inclusive and sustainable development. Um, and Anya is herself, in actual fact, an electrical engineer, having qualified from Jadavpur University, but she's also a Commonwealth Scholar with a Master's in Sustainable Development from Staffordshire University here in the UK. Um, she specialises in gender, culture and sustainability. And of course, the Art for Life initiative, which we heard about earlier on, is a leading example <laughs> of the types of intervention that are effective in this area. Um, Ananya, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, show my presentation, please. So today, you know, I'll take, what I'll talk briefly about is uh, some of the things which work, some of the good practices which worked uh, in the Art for Life uh, model we used uh, as was shared by Amitava and others. So next, please. So there will be three things I'd like to talk about. One is, you know, our philosophy was to for the art or the heritage to survive, the bearer or the practitioner has to survive. Art, if artist survives, then only art survives. And then as we started working, we realized that it is not the artist as an individual, but the artist as a community. So we really did a kind of a paradigm shift where we focused on the village. So I'll share some of the strategies we used. Then I'll talk about what we did for market and protection. And also, you know, in this post pandemic world, technology is very important. And we have this whole emerging sector of experience economy. I'll uh, share my experiences on that. Next, please. So art for life, you know, as I was saying, it is talking about the art form, the safeguarding of the art form, empowering the artist, and developing the village as a cultural hub. Until date, uh, we have covered around uh, 30,000, next please, 30,000 families in three states of India. And there has, this has contributed to alleviation of poverty, women empowerment, uh, promotion of uh, education for diversity, understanding the contribution of culture, SDG 4, improved uh, production processes, SDG 12, created uh, uh, alternative livelihood, SDG 8, SDG 11, where, you know, it uh, also, you know, led to uh, conservation of not only the intangible, but the tangible and the natural heritages of places. And uh, what Andrew had mentioned very importantly, fostering of international partnership, SDG 17. Next, please. Now, we showed you the Patachitra village and the resource center. The government in this state, they have supported development of 20 such living museums. And when we were started working, we found the first problem they had, they had no place to store, they had no place to practice, no place to promote. And so these centers, uh, resource centers, which have now emerged as living museums, particularly in villages of performing arts, um, has found a, well, it's kind of, you can say, icon of the power of heritage. Thanks, please. Um, Zain just mentioned about the importance of festival. As ICH languishes, many of the traditional festivals also languish. So what we did as a strategy is we did village festivals to create a new context for the traditions to flourish. This is the Chow dance. It's a martial dance. Uh, which is in the UNESCO representative list. And this festival is extremely popular. We often can't manage the number of groups who come and want to perform in the festival. It goes on for four or five days and they all come and perform and make new productions. Uh, what we have found and what others have also mentioned repeatedly that you know the power of economic development through ICH, it fosters social inclusion. And these villages, which were the most backward, most remote, and most marginalized, they have now emerged as destination, cultural destination, leading to the pride of the people. This has led to the engagement of young people, engagement of women, engagement of the larger community in other livelihoods, and all these have contributed to development. During the post-pandemic period, when you know uh, the government of India did a campaign vocal for local, and people were you know taking their car and going to nearby resorts, there was a weakened Incredible India campaign where people were encouraged to visit the artists, and in a situation when markets were down, there are no events, no exhibitions. 
cultural tourism helped in resilience because this local cultural tourism that led to income for the artists the much needed income and of course there are the big festivals like you know durga puja in bengal which lead to i mean it is one of the leading opportunities of income for the artists and the crafts persons across india these major festivals so festivals have indeed a very important role to play now coming to the question we are discussing in today's meeting that commercialization who controls so you know what we always started to do is directly link the artist to the market the maker to the market as anna marie was sharing that you know it is often government driven or private and effort driven it could be ngo driven and the traditional uh, tradition bearer the craftsman often plays a passive role so one thing we tried is to make him you know the strategist and work with her him and her to evolve strategies to market and that really uh, made a difference in the traditional we look at we look at marketing often there is this con concept of competition that you know there is often tremendous competition within the makers and this is where we work a lot we tell them that it is both at individual level and at collective level and to promote your art to promote your craft you have to build a brand as a collective and of course there will be competition between yourselves but then you then we promote the ideas of you know your own signature product your own niche of product making and that's why you know you we encourage innovation so we really need a shift in the way we think of marketing uh next please now i'll share some of the strategies we developed very recently as a part of a research project we did with coventry university and the objective of the project is to explore how digital technologies and ip can contribute to marketing and protection so i'll share some of our learnings from this research project next please we worked with three artist communities uh, with whom we have been working since 2005 Uh, baul and chau are both inscribed in the unesco representative list and the other was patachitra you had a glance of patachitra today so what we evolved is heritage sensitive ip and marketing strategies high pams as a name we have given and it is really the intersection of heritage skills marketing efforts and ip rights next please so in high pams what we say that the canvas of work has four quadrants first the community needs to be empowered the community has to have control the community has to benefit next the reputation of the work how can we get more and more people know about it and if we get to do that then all these uh, problems of loss of meaning and value do not happen the third aspect of it is skill repertoire you know we need to enrich the skills we need to support an ecosystem where there is regular innovation as i said ict is very living and the, all these together can create the positive cycle of empowerment so uh whenever we are talking about you know whether the actual tradition is getting lost in commercialization whether you know the designer is to, uh, uh, enforcing some design we used a tool called the roots and fruits of the tradition and we asked these communities to identify what are the basic roots and basic components of their heritage and then when we discuss that what could be there in the product so it could be a combination of the heritage attributes which are the roots so if you see the mask here this uh, rendition of the roots and fruits is a mask actually it's a chow mask Uh, from the chow dance and this is a modern rendition of the mask by the maker who has envisaged the world and you know the power of uh, greenery so it's a green mask you can say so you see it is having the basic roots the material is same the process of making is same but the attribute is very different from in the insert you can see the very adorned chow mask next please now the other part when we're talking of community empowerment is how we can make the community 
negotiate with the various stakeholders in the value chain, how they can say what they want and they can negotiate what they want. One big challenge in this sector is the lack of attribution and lack of recognition. So here's the example I've shared is from again Chow Dance. And this girl, Moshumi, she was one of the first, uh, she, she was the first girl who said that I want to dance Chow. It was a male dance and she formed a group. And her story was so powerful. She has got internationally awarded and uh, OTT platform, they did a film on her. And Moshumi did all the dancing in the film and she was remunerated. But nowhere in the film is Moshumi's name mentioned or the dance mentioned. So this is the kind of problem which the artists shared with us. Even for Patachitra, their paintings are used in diaries, in calendars, in uh, the Baal singers say their photos are used in events, but they're never even invited to the events. So what we did was code of ethics or art codes, we named them art codes, where these communities have listed for the stakeholders, what are their expectations from them? And this helped them to negotiate. They negotiated attribution, they negotiated proper uh, uh, infrastructure in case of, say, for example, Chow Dance, or if there's a cancellation of a call to an event compensation. So it is very important that artist communities are empowered you know, to negotiate. Next. Uh, I was talking of village festivals and when we were doing the reputation analysis, we were doing Google Analytics, we found that though every day there were photographers to these villages, though each of the festival attracted 5,000, 10,000 people all with camera, the mention of these art forms were not there. It was not coming up in our research. And the reason was people posted photos but never mentioned the art form, never mentioned the artist. So now the artists in their villages, they've put up notice boards and they're saying, you're welcome to take photos because that promotes my work, but use the Creative Commons license, CCBYNC, you attribute us and don't use it commercially. If you use it commercially, let us know. So these are some of the very simple strategies which really worked. Next, please. Now, as Andrew also mentioned, that you know, it is all about telling stories. We have moved away from the days of selling products or even selling services because we are in the days of experience economy today. We are selling experiences, we are selling stories. So our communities need to be empowered in using the technology. The Patachetra artist said, let's see, Potter Gun is what is vital to us. Potter Gun means the songs which they sing when they tell the story. But when I sell my painting or when I sell a t-shirt with the painting or even a tree with the painting, the song is not there. So the song is going, we are losing the song. And we really found that the young boys in the village, they were not learning singing anymore because it was, you know, the painting which was attracting remuneration. So what was done in consultation with the artist, you know, we did QR codes, we did a recorded and the artists now send video recording of songs or sell these, uh, send these WhatsApp, these QR codes. And there's much more demand on the songs and people, who, whoever buys the scroll or the Patachitra diversified products, they demand the song. So as a result, now the boys are also learning singing. So you know, it also helps in protection of the heritage. Another thing was, which was used to tell the stories was packaging. So all the packaging had labels and attributes where the um, artists were shared more information. Next. Now, I was talking about individual and collective marketing. So what was done? There were websites, there were social media pages of the collectives, as well as individuals. And we trained them in digital storytelling. And this opened up, I'll show a short video right after this. This really opened up the world to other artists. Next, please. Now, among the IP strategies, uh, because you know, in our strategy of work, we have developed the community collectives in all the villages we work. It was easy. So we work with the government. And now these art forms, they have got GI registration. Five of the art forms have got GI registration. And the individual craftspersons are getting GI registered. GI is being used as part of their labeling, as part of their branding. So it is 
Also, you know, GI is also telling the story, say, particularly that colors are made from flowers and fruits. It's a green GI. It is also telling the story of environment friendliness of this creative sector. So GI has also emerged as a very powerful tool and it is also attracting tourism. I'll show a short video which will illustrate how the artists were benefited. So this is one of the Chow mask makers. Namaskar, I'm a name Dharmendra Sutrodar. I'm a John Chow Mokos Shilpi, Jalapurliya. আমি বলবো প্রথমে যে অনেকেই ভুল করেছে আমি যে আগে থেকে সোশ্যাল মিডিয়াতে আসিনি জেনেছিলাম না আপনাদের হাত ধরে হাই প্যান্স এনেছেন যে সোশ্যাল মিডিয়াতে চলো মুখোস বা শিল্প বিভিন্ন শিল্পতে কিভাবে এগিয়ে যেতে হয় অনেক ভুল করেছে আমি না আমাদের গ্রামে আগে থেকে আসিনি আজকে এসে হাই প্যান্স থেকে আমি অনেকেই অনলাইনে অর্ডার পাচ্ছি বিক্রি করছি এবং বাড়ির থেকে জিনিসটা দিতে পাচ্ছি কোথাও আমাকে নিয়ে যেতে হচ্ছে না পয়সাও পেয়ে যাচ্ছে এই মোটামুটি দু তিন দিন থেকে ধরে দু জায়গার থেকে বিদেশ থেকে যেমন আমেরিকার থেকে আমার কল এসছেন ওনারা বলছেন যে হাই প্যাম্পস থেকে আমি দেখেছি তোমার মুখোশ খুবই সুন্দর আমার চাই কয়েকটা মুখোশ আমাকে অর্ডার দিয়েছে তো মানে ভাবনার বাইরে হাই প্যাম্পস থেকে সত্যিকারের আমাদের ঘরে বসে যে উন্নতি হচ্ছে রোজগার হচ্ছে এটা ভাবনা মানে মুশকিল যে হতে পারে আমাদের গ্রামী অঞ্চল জঙ্গলমহল ভেবেছিলাম না কিন্তু আজকে হচ্ছে ভবিষ্যতেও হাই প্যাম্পসকে ধরে মনে হয় মনে হয় না অনেক আগিয়ে যাব নতুন ধরনের এই লকডাউনে দু হাজার একুশ কুড়ি একুশে আমি করেছি সো বেসিক্যালি ইভেন ডিউরিং দ্য প্যান্ডেমিক ইউ নো দিস কমিউনিটিস কন্টিনিউ টু আর্ন থ্রু ইউজ অফ দিস স্ট্র্যাটেজিস অফ লোকাল ট্যুরিজম অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ ইউ নো ডিজিটাল use of digital tools so with that i'd like to end thank you thank you very much indeed ananya that's very kind of you really very interesting i'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that as we go along and i think you've just answered some of the questions that were being asked to me to be honest with you as well so last but by no means least we're going to move on to michelle uh, uh, aziz ahmad who is an independent promoter of high craftsmanship and the founder of MIAA and is based in Dakar in Bangladesh. Um, he is um, a promoter of social entrepreneurship, craftsmanship, natural indigo, and exclusive timeless handmade textiles. Um, he's interesting because he's worked in the context of taking product into international markets and indeed into very high end fashion brands like LVMH and uh, Galerie Lafayette and Hermes. Um, and the like. Uh, he worked between 2007 and 2019 for Get Care Bangladesh, where he managed Living Blue. And now he runs his own firm, MIAA, where he represents handling weavers of Jamdani, silk and cotton to local and international buyers. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, everyone here. So I will have my, uh, my lecture I talk divided into two parts. First, I will give you a background of the work that I did over the years, and then I'll talk a few, uh, get get a bit detailed into a few of the things. And that's what my presentation is about, of how I worked with Living Blue and how did we together in Living Blue took uh, the craftsmanship to a higher uh, international market. So my experience with crafts and fashion are entirely through my work. Uh, with no specialized uh, training. And I always admired people who can design and develop objects with their hands. Uh, since I'm not one of them, like, I, like I'm not a maker or a creator, life has enabled me to work with such talented people to uh, market their goods in places that, that's most suitable. So taking crafts and uh, crafted fashion to the most suitable market has been the key strategy of mine. For that, I, for one, would not leave a stone unturned, say, until now. Uh, during the early years of my, uh, during the early years of my career, which is around 2008, 9, 10, I worked to establish production centers of basketry and uh, floor mats uh, in rural Bangladesh. Uh, 
projects uh, meant to train women and allow them to have income of their own and contribute to household income. So this has been my whole uh, idea about working with crafts and craftsmen. It's that, yes, uh, we can go to interesting markets. Uh, sometimes this uh, way of working is very uh, fascinating as well. But ultimately, uh, I, what, what stems my idea is that we need to change the lives or improve the lives of the craftsmen. Uh, so projects made to train these, and uh, this would uh, make these women more independent and form on respect uh, from the families and community. I also recognize this format creates a rural employment, thus limiting urban migration with a real income being higher. So people who are living in the villages and having an income which is uh, equivalent to someone working in a garments factory in Dhaka or around Dhaka, the real income is much higher. All my following uh, endeavor to take Bangladesh craftsmanship to the luxury market thereafter stems from this belief that the life back home will be better for some people if I can make sure that craftsmen, uh, uh, the craftspeople gets higher value for his or handmade produce. When I started to work uh, more intensely with crafts, dyes, textiles from 2013, that's, that's uh, when I started to work with Living Blue, which is a social enterprise of care Bangladesh. By, uh, by directly managing it as a hired entrepreneur. I wanted to make best use of the opportunity. I was extremely fortunate to have a group of talented craftspeople uh, and, the, and the finest natural indigo that is produced in Northern Bangladesh in my hands. My first job, uh, my first job was to make my craftspeople uh, uncomfortable by asking them to experiment. I never wanted to change their craft, of course, nor did I want them to learn new crafts every time and to wet the beak of the commercial market. Rather, within their craftsmanship, wanted to push them to their, to their limits and do things that they didn't think was possible by them. I felt I must always innovate and develop crafts. Uh, we, and develop crafts we do to surprise my customers, buyers, as well as my craftsmen. I'm particularly proud to have established that with the with uh, both sides of the coin, that is, that that if humanly possible, we shall do it. Meanwhile, I started participating in trade fairs and uh, retail shows, home, home and abroad. Being from a non-fashion producing country, I mean, mind it, Bangladesh is a huge garment producing nation, but not necessarily known for its uh, fashion goods, and uh, not even known for its rich craft heritage. Not not much but mass-produced garments, yes. If I cannot go and show, I do not expect to be discovered as fast as I want to. With our uh, basic yet telling sub affair, I started showcasing and started receiving orders. More, more work meant regular income for the artisans. During these intense visits and a continuous roving eye of mine, I landed uh, meeting lots of people from all over the world and soon, we will be working with designers from different cultures and nations and make goods for them as per their luxury market. However, without changing or learning any new craft, but rather honing and going deeper with our own crafts of katha, shibori, and dine. <clears throat> we never wanted to compromise with any of the things uh, we know. Also, we wanted to be established as a label ourselves. So I had to negotiate hard too for price and getting our name on the labels. I had the opportunity to work with global luxury giants, uh, with individual designers and boutiques. I was able to make the workplace of the craftspeople I work with uh, to make completely compliant. Uh, that gives me and the place I was a lot of pleasure as it did not happen in one day, but with continuous work. So it happened over the years, and I worked with Living Blue for six years from 2013 to 2019. And uh, now I work on my own. And I go back to the presentation that you are seeing now, I'll start it. So I'll just get to a few important points. So that was the story, I mean, with Living Blue, uh, the work that we did, and it was extremely fortunate for me to have in my hand the group of artisans and the artwork that they could do. So my job was made easy in a way because uh, I mean I already had in hand a tremendous uh, crafts work, but also we we also had to constantly improve upon it, innovate upon it, and uh, find ways to make it contemporary. So that was the most important. 
So how I see the importance of high quality. So it's never to compromise on quality and follow the mantra and do it mercilessly, right? Find out skilled craftsmen and artisan and develop with them. So sometimes, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to more details a bit later. When working with natural dyes, handmade goods, by default, the good becomes out of the ordinary. We need to recognize it ourselves and make sure that the our counterparts recognize it too. Something that is extraordinary has to be of high quality. I mean, if you consider it to be extraordinary and you claim it to be, then you need to prove it with the quality. Every step, every detail must be meticulously monitored. Importance of high quality. While well, remembering handmade imperfections are its beauty. A bad grammar is not beautiful either. So an example of a bad grammar is when we do the quilt. There are two, there are many, may, quite a few uh, methods that you follow on a, on a, when, when people, when someone is quilting. One is say, uh, we call it jora and bejo, which is odd and even. So the, how the stitches are going together. So if it's a odd structure of quilting that has to go throughout the quilt, you cannot mix it, things like that. So that's a bad grammar if, if, if it is mixed. It's futile to compare quality and price of mass produced goods. It's something people would consider like with, I mean, <laughs> that's one question if you need an expensive denim, pair of denim or not, or you don't need anything on this, right? But say uh, $300, $400, $500, maybe more pair of denim. And uh, why it is so expensive? And there are so many reasons that it can be expensive. And why not like a $10, uh, $10 denim, right? So how, how do you explain to people? So that's very important. Uh, anything that is done slow can never be cheap, but can be affordable. We should work towards to make it more affordable, but it can never be cheap. Make the designed natural diet handmade pieces contemporary classics. Uh, and, in, and indigo is always in fashion. I mean, blue is always there, indigo is always there. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a classic thing, it never goes out. So marketing the label. The strength is in the design and in the quality of the print. Once you value your creative work with a price, know your customers, that is, develop the product. I mean, that's how the craftsmanship work, right? The company, you develop it. And then there are customers, but those customers are not like uh, regularly out there for you. Uh, you need to probably find out where they are, and that's how you market it. But it's not that you uh, you you make the price as per the customer. That's not how craftsmen work or or crafted goods work. Target and market to fashionable and conscious customers. People who are fearful. I mean, I'm talking now of the fashion world. People who are fearful of fashion and thinks fashion is future are not our customers. There are many people I know who looks down upon people who are in fashion. I mean. It's a personal choice and there's nothing to look down upon. But say, it's also someone who's doing a passion, maybe supporting uh, craftsmen, right? So it's, it's our, we need to know our target per person and target, uh, target customers who are, do they value what you are doing or not? Knowing which shows to go to can be the trickiest part. Research on the shows uh, one could go to. That's very important mm -hmm. because it's expensive to travel, uh, to pay the fee, to develop the products for that show and you need to get business out of it. But you also have to uh, understand that going a show once probably may not give you a lot of business. You need to maybe go a few times because the buyers need to need to know you. You need to keep on developing for those markets. You need to also understand the market that you're going. So I'll give you a little example. Like uh, I used to go to this show in Berlin. It was a nice show. But uh, I mean, for the the market that we got in Germany for our kind of crafts, I, I, I realized later that probably it was not the best of the places. But I, first I went because I thought it's a big economy and, uh, but it's not really a fashion conscious or a craft conscious market. They're more of a sustainability conscious uh, market. So for us, the ideal market was Japan, France, USA, Canada, UK, to some extent, Italy, uh, Australia, India. These are these are good places for our kind of goods that where people have an understanding of craftsmanship and they're ready to pay for it as well. 
<coughs> okay. Being sustainable is being responsible, but being able to articulate the uniqueness of the design and workmanship is decisive, that is storytelling. I mean, of course, you need to be sustainable in a way that you need uh, your business needs to work out finally, uh, and uh, there has to be compliance, and those are those are things that you must ensure and make make sure that it happens. But that's not the that's not the part that is moving the earth, right? But you, but how you are articulating your work and the design, and are people going to get it? So that part is also very vital. Keep researching and developing new things always. I mean that's very important, even with limited craft. Uh, I mean craft knowledge, or say the 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 craftsmen that you're working with, you don't expect them to learn new things, right? They have, a, they already have a, a skill which they are, in, they, are, they are masters. But within that limit, it's you, we should be able to produce new things or innovate. So you see this photo; it's local, international in green showroom. If someone is operating the presentation, can go three slides back. So it's a local. Yes. Local international, yes, local international and green showroom. So this was a present. Uh, we did a show in Salon Showroom, Berlin. It was nice. It was you know all these materials, the dyes, and even the uh, tailoring is done in Bangladesh. But how did we work in Living Blue? Was I used to work with this uh, uh, designers from different parts and different backgrounds. So they come with different ideas, but my our technique remains the same. We are not learning new things for everyone. So how we can adapt with our technique with uh, a contemporary idea, that's where the challenge is. That's where I get a lot of fun. And that's what we did in all the collections that we did. This is I'm working the which uh, I'm now I'm currently working with is Jamdani, which is the authentic, uh, geographically integrated, recognized textile of Dhaka. Um, this is something very really amazing that we have, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of things can be done with it. I mean, Jamdani is not necessarily a compliant industry much, and uh, it has not really been taken to a scale that uh, like a couture or ut couture. Uh, level not yet. I mean, yes, it is a, it is itself an utkutu in a way that for the for the traditional uh, way of that it is used as a sari mostly in Bangladesh and South Asia and the South Asian diaspora who value Jabnani highly. But you know, it can also be it can also be uh, uh, it can also be used differently and still be contemporary. You've got a, a minute left, Michelle. Yes, yes, I'm 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 done. I'm almost done, right, and I'm on my last slide. And so possibilities, I think, are endless. On the left, it's a picture that of uh, the work we did with uh, Louis Vuitton Moet NEC's label, uh, one of their own uh, label, it's called Loewe. So Loewe has a craft uh, competition, and we participated in 2016, it was 2017 craft prize, and uh, the, promote, the artisan that they promoted with Akatha, she came as a finalist of one of 26 from a list of almost 4,000 global submissions. That was an amazing achievement for Living Blue, for us and Bangladesh and for my craftsmen. And through that connection, we landed orders with Loewe after a series of uh, sampling and working with them, meeting the design team in Paris. So it was an amazing experience. And finally, a uh, few pieces went, of course, there was orders from them. And also a few pieces were running on Paris Fashion Week, which is, I find, a uh, Amazing for our craftsmanship in Bangladesh. And on the right pick uh, is a collection that we did with Galerie Lafayette. And it's a collection on the window display in Paris that was April 2016. And uh, both these pictures and the uh, experience of mine with the quality and crafts with my craftsmen uh, really is something that has uh, uh, made me a different person. And uh, like, because it made me that I need to continue working on it, but there's a lot of challenge. Uh, but you know, somehow it's like a, uh, you are stuck into it, and you, you need to probably, I mean, you know, work, you know, work with the customer and make it better. So that's 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 what I do. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. It was very interesting. 
Um, I, I, I think uh, it's been a fascinating group of presentations that um, really um, do tell a story about the issues facing the sector here in South Asia, but also some of the innovation and some of the innovative approaches that are available. And I think in the context of the type of dialogue that you want to create across the region, it's really important to see that there are different ways of thinking about things and new approaches that you can try. Um, what we need to make sure is that everybody has the opportunity to, to develop the skills to do those things and has actually, we can actually begin to build the data up because we need to be able to inform policymakers about these things and how effective they are to try and persuade them that in actual fact they should become more involved. Anyway, now we can move on to questions. There are a few questions already, but I am going to ask um, the panelists, therefore, just to um, hold themselves ready in this context, um, because um, I need to move between you um, uh, digitally um, in terms of asking the questions. I apologize um, if I'm being a little bit clum clumsy about that. Anyway, um, the first, it's on my mobile phone, not there. Uh, the first questions that I have um, is one for um, uh, Nazla and for Anne Marie. Um, for the handicrafts industry in Maldives and Sri Lanka, what are the opportunities and challenges the handicraft stroke private sector businesses, etc., outside the country uh, proactively um, advocate? How does cross border cooperation happen? Okay, shall I go first? You go for first, as that's fine. All right. Um... Well, um, the Maldives, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, we are fairly new to the intangible cultural heritage preservation. Um, the unlike natural heritage, which is uh, the selling phase of tourism industry, uh, enjoys a strong state protection. Cultural heritage, on the other hand, is usually taken for granted or and neglected. Uh, the management of arts and culture sector has changed hand several times over the, over the past 10 years. The frequent change of administrative framework appears to be the key problem in the development and implementation of strategic framework for the culture. However, uh, the emphasis on preserving uh, intangible cultural heritage began uh, soon after establishment of the Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage uh, in 2018. Uh, out of which the most significant contribution was the enactment of the Cultural Heritage Act. So uh, as of now, we do not have a proper inventory or a proper um, uh, uh, list of people who, uh, who are actually practicing this. So we don't have a list of cultural practitioners at the moment, which we are still trying to develop. So perhaps after that, uh, we can possibly start um, promoting uh, the handicrafts better. But for now, we do have uh, young uh, youth who are focused on um, innovative, uh, pro innovative products. I would say um, they, they are promoting uh, cross-border as well. But for now, uh, we are very much, uh, the, the ministry is very much focused on um, developing an inventory. But we do have in our strategic plan, we do have um, promotion and cross-border promotion uh, uh, in, in, in the plans. Thank you. Anne-Marie. Uh, so I think um, my response um, is maybe perhaps different from how, how was. Um, there's, so I'm a big proponent of the recognition of traditional knowledges um, within the framework of intellectual property rights or some amount, some ways of formalizing um, the, the kind of value addition that traditional knowledge brings to the table and traditional cultural expressions. And Ananya actually touched on this in her presentation. Um, things like trademarks and geographical indications are a way of formalizing this um, and creating that, you know, like a, like a tangible uh, recognition of the value addition. Um, and I think it's it's these kind of things that make uh, the promotion, not just promotion, but the the viability of uh, crafts 
across borders, um, and especially between the global south and the global north, where um, a more so that kind of cross border um, promotion and 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 sales uh, where it really brings value. Um, the reason I get into that is because the point is that craftsmen are still they are they are promoting their, their products um, overseas. So we saw that example in the, in the video that Ananya shared, and we've got um, designers like uh, Michael and the, um, the cohort that he was working with um, in Germany, between Germany and Bangladesh. You've got designers, you've got crafters, you've got, um, you've got people working in this space um, and working to get uh, you know, our traditional crafts promoted, not just regionally, but internationally. Um, there's really important markets that are available regionally. There's there's, however, there's a higher flux and higher, you know, higher payoff when trying to address some, um, trying to target global north markets. But the problem is there's there's an unfair um, power dynamic where often global south countries are only recognized for the labor value that, that they bring rather than recognition for, you know, the production value. And that's where I see things like geographical indications, um, recognition of traditional designs, um, patents, those kinds of things coming in as as important value additions. Um, and there it is the responsibility of governments and um, international bodies such as UNESCO, such as um, the HCAP committee um, to, to try and create a framework from which you know, individual actors can, can work from. So I think that's, that's uh, looking at it from more of a macro perspective. I think that's what could be done to, to promote uh, crafts. Thank you very much, Emma. I mean, I think it's very interesting that um, we've got tomorrow morning uh, Daphne Zografos Johnson, who's going to uh, make a presentation, the keynote speech tomorrow morning, who's from the traditional knowledge division at uh, WIPO in Geneva. Um, and, I, you know, this is a, a, a piece of uh, global um, legislation and a new convention that has been long in development, but is obviously critically needed, but very complicated to deliver as far as um, the sector is concerned. So it'd be very interesting to hear um, from her in terms of the, of the progress she's making. Does anybody else have any comments to make on, on, on the question that was asked there that they, that they feel that would be relevant now? Nobody's unmuting, so I assume not. Um, I have to say, Ananya, just to let you know that I did just click on the take photograph of the QR code and it has come through, so it is working. I'm pleased to say that the QR code is working. Glad, glad that you did it. So now um, we have, uh, uh, just to say to everybody as well, please, if you want to ask a question, there is a put your hand up facility, so I'm very happy to take them in that way. Um, you can find that um, uh, uh, at the bottom of the, the, the bar, I hope in your Zoom um, uh, screen. Um, or um, you can just message me um, through the chat and I'm very happy to ask the question for you, whichever you'd prefer to do. But please don't hold back from asking questions, given we have got such a great panel here um, to, to, for you to engage with. Um, I do have another question which was directed towards me, but I think in some ways was answered already by Ananya. It's a question which says, in South Asia, the very rich handicraft industry has created talents, but education and literacy are problems. It's extremely challenging to translate entrepreneurial management skill, business skill to a vocabulary that these craftspersons can internalize. And that they do not know, if they do not do that on their own, maximizing benefits from markets can become difficult. How do we handle that according to you? Um, I, I'm not suggesting for one moment that it is a simple process. Um, I mean, uh, when we did the training in Pakistan that Zain was talking about, it was delivered entirely in English. And, um, uh, that obviously was limiting as far as participants were concerned in terms of people who the people who could access it. Um, in fact, all the work that I end up doing around the world does to some degree end up being delivered in English, though in some places it does get translated then into the local language. So I'm working on a project in the moment in Colombia where everything is being translated into Spanish. But it is a hugely problematic area. But at the same time, there are technology tools there which can help in this way. Um, and there are all sorts of ways in which these in which we can communicate. So, for example, why not talk about using some of the skills that are there within the community to try and actually um, look at the way in which th th these stories can be told? There are storytellers within communities 
if you can share what you're trying to do with them, can they find new ways of helping to tell these stories and sharing them within the community? What you're wanting to do at this stage is just give people a real sense of how different the world is beyond their village and their community that they may be then looking at as a market. And I think there are many different ways to do that. And I know that, for example, when I was looking at the work Michelle had been doing, he's taken um, um, artisans, handicraft makers um, to Germany, to Paris. Um, those are extraordinary opportunities for them, but very, very rare. But of course, what they can do then, if that's being done, is feed that back in terms of audio recordings, in terms of different ways of doing this. And of course, the extraordinary thing at this stage that we have within the sector today, and this became very apparent when I was doing some work for UNESCO about five years ago, looking at Pakistan, was the boom that all of a sudden appeared in terms of mobile phone ownership. So it was no longer a matter of the fact that you could only access the internet through a computer, which was sitting in a family space. All of a sudden it was there in the palm of your hand and you could access it through, through the palm of your hand. And it was cheap enough for you to be able to do that. And so looking at new ways in which you can use this technology to be able to communicate with people and share experiences with people, I think is incredibly important. Um, there is another question now from uh, Robert um, about the role of universities in future young designers when many of the curriculum that they follow in their home countries come from the global north. I'd imagine that education institutes play an important role with government as well. Indeed so. And there's no doubt about the fact that there is a need to develop um, training programs which are, uh, in, are relative, relevant to the context of place and the situation within society. But as I said before, I don't think that means that you stop there. I think you do need to be able to look at the way in which you ensure that a designer uh, or an entrepreneur starts to build up a far greater sense of the market around them. So that could be regionally, or it could be globally as well. And of course, there are neat reasons for wanting to be able to reach out into the global north, because that is where there is a lot of money and where there is a big market in terms of buying products in different ways. So, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, um, the whole question of the role of the higher education sector is critical in this. And I will say, and I, it's a question I wanted to ask actually of all the uh, um, other panelists today, was we've heard a lot about the role of government and obviously the conventions are targeted towards an engagement and are ratified by governments. But I just wondered whether or not um, you feel that your government in your country actually understands the creative economy agenda. Who wants to go first and answer that? I might like to step in on that because I worked for a publication um, to look at the economic potential for a creative economy, sorry, the, the general potential for an eco a pivot to a, um, a creative economy in Sri Lanka. Um, and what I can say is from a country where there is instability, changes of government, and also people who hold offices who don't have the background um, education that, that adequately puts them there. Um, I think there's still, there are things that government needs to do and I will always push for that. But the fact of the matter is when you have um, these other frameworks to work in, it still gives power to people, to individuals um, in the private sector outside of government to still um, have, to still use them to, to, to leverage in their, in their work. So even with the, so Sri Lanka has ratified the 2003 convention on ICH, which is great, but there hasn't been enough movement on create, you know, about creating national policy. But what that has done is given, um, craft workers and, and designers in Sri Lanka a value addition for the for the kinds of projects that they're trying to do. So they've created groups amongst themselves, created markets amongst themselves, and they're promoting this um, using the language that's available, even if the government is not um, taking a proactive approach. So I think it's still important for even outside of um, public sector uh, actors. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Chitrim, you, you've got your hand up and I assume it's to answer the question. Um, do you want to unmute and, 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 and join in the discussion? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Andrew. <clears throat> uh, in Bhutan, government has a lucrative uh, section of the, uh, ICH, uh, related to ICH, because uh, most of the skills that Bhutan has at the moment, we don't have a mass industrial scale production uh, 
but uh, arts and crafts uh, have been gaining a momentum in the country uh, since the establishment of our agency in 2011. Uh, during that time, we were just uh, created as a special purpose vehicle uh, to cater to the handicraft needs, development of handicraft. But uh, uh, in, uh, right now, we are in 12 five year plan. Uh, when the 11 five year plan was launched, uh, the government asked the agency to align and uh, submit the proposals for, uh, for the 11 five year plan. So we have started uh, proposing trainings and uh, establishment of raw material bank and clusters for artisans to work together. So from that, then uh, a few years back, the Department of uh, Small and Cottage Industry, Cottage and Small Industry, sorry, uh, under the Ministry of Economic Affairs have uh, established an incubation center here in the capital where um, young entrepreneurs with uh, unique ideas, uh, be it in uh, arts and craft or innovation, uh, technological innovation. So they have uh, uh, created an incubation center here in the capital. And we also, the government also launched uh, CSI, uh, uh, wait, let me see. Uh, have uh, recently launched a national CSI development bank, which uh, supports the artisans uh, uh, to avail uh, financial support. So I think in a way government uh, is now really into really looking after the de development of arts and crafts. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have any data to show that uh, uh, the export, the figures of handicraft uh, sectors. So I think they are conducting, they will be conducting a survey, economic uh, survey uh, very soon. So uh, one of the uh, criteria in that uh, survey will be uh, economic output of uh, handicrafts. Thank you. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Um, Zaim, do you want to, to add something? I yes. think you want to add something. So I'm just, uh, I would just like to practically tell you that uh, we have uh, some interest at the government level here in Pakistan, especially in the province of Punjab, because we recently got a $50 million loan for to set up the Punjab Tourism for Economic Growth project. And as part of that $50 million loan, there are several components. Uh, one of those was uh, is actually the capacity building and documentation and mapping of uh, of, of industries, uh, uh, creative industries. Now, what that has done is actually brought into light the symbiotic relationship between tourism and uh, intangible cultural heritage. So I believe that we're in a very good position. The stage is all set. All we need to do is to look at some evidence and data. And what I've been able to do is look at the label force survey for Pakistan and identify the occupation codes for uh, for cultural and creative industry related occupations. There's a list of about 17 different occupations that uh, is <laughs> part of uh, the International Standard Occupation Code book, which I believe uh, can be the starting point. And then you can zoom in to see whether you have secondary data like the Women uh, Economic Wellbeing Survey that I was uh, showing you the other day, um, Andrew. Uh, these are the kinds of, uh, you can say, uh, different types of evidence that you can build around to come up with that argument that is backed by substantial evidence to nudge and you know try to actually ask the government to, to look towards that policy, especially in countries where tourism is of prime importance, I believe intangible cultural heritage and the symbiotic relationship between the two is not a difficult thing for the government to understand and probably try to you know, work out a policy uh, direction around that. Uh, but what we need to do is do we have to look into data. There's a lot of data available in the labor force survey. There's a lot of data available in different economic. You don't have to just go out for a completely different census or an economic survey. There's already existing data available and the existing repositories with the National Bureaus of Statistics or the provincial or the federating units, they may have their own bureaus of statistics that you can use that data from and, and build your argument and, and actually just try to ask government and, and you know present something. I am on, uh, so I'm starting out on coming up with a craft strategy for the province of Punjab, hopefully, with the primary data exercise that I shared with you, uh, just uh, you know a glimpse of that today, 
I think that I can start out from the labor force survey and then come up with different uh, women uh, economic and social well-being surveys and also the primary data exercise. I can zoom in to the real problem and real policy intervention that's required from the government. So that's a bit from my side. Thank you, Zaim. Does anybody else want to comment at all? Uh, okay, Dama. You need to unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in Nepal, government uh, is uh, working with working for uh, ICS sector. Uh, Nepal government is uh, formulate the uh, and working with uh, uh, with uh, private sectors. And there is a small and cottage industry development board and uh, Nepal Tourism Board and Nepal Academy of uh, Fine Arts. Uh, these uh, uh, these organization is uh, working. Uh, to promote the Nepalese art and craft and traditional uh, skills, how to uh, develop the traditional skill. And uh, Nepal government uh, provide the soft loan for the craft peoples and especially women sectors, women uh, uh, sectors. And the Nepal government is uh, conducting some trainings, uh, trade fair, seminars, uh, uh, and publish the book and craft mapping uh it is a collaboration with uh, private sectors and i think uh, this is a uh, very good to the promoting uh, uh the uh, the craft uh, sector and it should be um, uh, uh make uh, the uh, policy government should make the good policy uh, then uh, the craft is uh, going to upgrading it get the chance to upgrading it thank you i just like to say that in india a lot of thing is happening go ahead go ahead Ananya. Uh, uh, in india a lot of things is happening but what we need is really you know the integration because there's lack of recognition of intersection of you know technology creative economy heritage i think that's why we need to work as a country no, I, I, my experience, certainly from working in India, uh, though it is a while ago since I spent a lot of time there, um, mm -hmm. but working in Pakistan and to some degree in Bangladesh is that one of the problems that you have is that actually within government, the agenda isn't terribly well understood necessarily. Mm -hmm. And when you get down to provincial level, it becomes even more problematic in terms of um, a, a lot of um, uh, negative reactions towards um, the internet, for example, and the role of the internet and how, how it can be used, which to my mind is largely about the fact that people aren't used to using it in many ways. But um, we are, I'm afraid, out of time. Um, and in fact, I've allowed it to run over by over 10 minutes. So I apologise to you all for that. If I can, I can give my thanks to uh, Anya, to Marie, to Nazla, to Dharma, to Mishael, to Tsetrim and to Zaim for um, their contributions today. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for listening patiently. And I hope it's been an interesting and useful um, uh, discussion and that uh, you'll stay around for the next two days for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating uh, three-day event. Many thanks indeed. Andrew, we would like to take a group photo. So request everyone to turn on the video and we can. Okay. <laughs> A group photo again. <laughs>